we have a, a very special treat this week. And uh, uh, every time that I see Mr. Waterhouse, it's always a good, you know, good feeling to have him come around. And, you know, you always like to have somebody that's positive about what's happening in the church and uh, the activities going on. But uh, it's hard to, to see Mr. Waterhouse without thinking again, you know, the number of years he's been around. And, uh, you know, we have the, the scriptures that uh, we are at war with Satan, our adversary, who is trying to destroy us. And, uh, you know, you think about going to war, which we have to do whether you want to or not. You're going to have to battle Satan. And if you don't battle, you're going to lose. And if you were in the army and uh, you chose your first lieutenant, you were going to follow into the battle, you know, into the, the, the fracas, then uh, you'd probably choose someone who'd been up that hill before and had come down. You wouldn't want to choose necessarily someone who had uh, gone up and uh, maybe had come down sort of mangled and scarred up and you wondered if he was going to be able to make it up this second time, but you'd want to choose somebody who had gone up there and come back down alive many times. And I think you can look at Mr. Waterhouse and say, boy, you know, he's been around for such a long time now. He's been up and come down and gone up and come down again many, many times. So we're very glad to have him here in Amarillo that he'd come by and pay us a visit and speak to us. Greetings to all of you. I get uh, a little help here. I'm going to need it dead with my throat acting up. I, uh, I missed one activity in the past 27 years. And a lot of times I've spoken almost every day, year on end. That was down in Australia after the Feast of Tabernacles in 1960. I got sick uh, the Wednesday after the feast. And otherwise, I've uh, gone 27 years without missing an activity, but this one was one I thought I might have to miss. I got back uh, on uh, my touring last Monday in Pasadena. I've been, out, uh, I've been able to visit 287 churches since last March. And uh, things went real well. I had no problem in my throat had problems about every other place, but my throat kept functioning real well. And uh, after I got back, got back on Monday night, Tuesday morning, my throat was a little bit sore, and I went down and jogged. I'd missed about a week because of the bad weather in Arizona and, and up in Nevada. And, uh, well, I shaked this off, and I went down the next morning and jogged and came up to the faculty dining room after the workout and they were having a meeting there with men who had gone out on uh, the plane the previous week, and, well, my head got thick and a lot thicker, and I began to feel about as low as I felt in a long time, and I realized the old flu bug had, uh, had really bit me hard. I uh, was feeling fairly well when we left uh, Pasadena yesterday, but uh, I almost died last night. Well, I really didn't, but uh, I, uh, I was uh, just completely out, and finally woke up about 10.30 this morning, and I feel like, you know, kind of half-drugged, if you know what I mean. You go into one of those deep sleeps and wake up, and your body's sort of dead, and right arm is asleep, and I could really relate to those people who have, uh, you know, uh, uh, paralyzed members. But with God's help, hope to get through the afternoon, so you can bear with me. If I sound tight and husky, you'll know I am, so you won't misread that. <clears throat> we had a, uh, a very good ruling. Uh, passed down to us last, uh, I believe about Wednesday. Judge Johnson had made a, uh, a ruling, oh, let's see, about December the 13th that, uh, the Attorney General could not, uh, uh, take possession of 6,918 documents that a particular law firm had, uh, but that order was to run out on the 20th. And as it ran out, the uh, Attorney General and his uh, scavengers opened the first box, and the first thing they pulled out was one that was not recorded, which indicated quite a lot that uh, they couldn't be sure then that the records were accurate as to what had been set forth in uh, all of their illegal gathering of our documents, that, uh, that it was all uh, uh, properly accounted for. And uh, it, uh, simultaneous to that, we had made an approach to the uh, California Supreme Court and the chief justice out there, her name is Rose Bird. I think she'd seen the documentary that some of the men are showing now that are being sent out on weekends. Uh, uh, it's uh, one hour in length. I saw it in Tucson about a couple of weeks ago. It's called, entitled, State versus Church. And apparently this uh, chief justice, Rose Bird, had seen that because she's a little bit edgy now, and she passed the word down that she was going to extend this uh, Judge Johnson's uh, uh, rule that uh, that the Attorney General, no one could have access to these documents until she was able to hear all of the appeals that we'd set forth, 
And so she said, we're going to stop everything right here. There can be uh, the Attorney General, no one else can go any further in trying to secure documents or anything in addition to what has already been secured until she could consider these appeals and decide then whether or not she would allow the Attorney General to go any further. So that has given us a little more breathing room there, for which we're very thankful. But uh, with her drastic change there, they felt maybe she saw this uh, documentary, which uh, when I saw it in Tucson, my old blood got uh, to boiling and made you want to, you know, forget for a minute that God takes vengeance and grab a hold of some uh, illegalist uh, who had come in and, and, uh, and raided uh, God's headquarters, and the property is deeded to God out there. I hope all of you realize that. That property is not deeded to Mr. Armstrong and Russell, deeded to the great God of heaven. It belongs to him. And I'll guarantee you when they trample on that, as Dr. Kessler said the other night, uh, when he walks on the property realizing it's deeded to God, it's like, you know, come around the fiery bush. He says sometimes he feels like taking his shoes off because God says this is holy ground. And when the attorney general stepped on that, he just shouldn't have done it. And, uh, of course, if God uh, doesn't stop it short of the Supreme Court, maybe short of the world tomorrow, he's going to make all of them in the world tomorrow uh, bow down before Mr. Armstrong and acknowledge their wretched, rotten, filthy, un underhanded, satanic uh, onslaught of his property. You can rest assured of that. God's going to make everyone bow down before Mr. Armstrong in the world tomorrow because he's going to be in the family of God. He's going to have the program that's going to teach everyone how to worship God and how to love neighbor. And if they won't do it, they're dealing with God Almighty through his government, and you can't do that. The Bible says all these are going to bow before Jesus Christ and all tongues are going to confess him and he's going to work through a system. And he tells us the Philadelphia era that they're going to come up in the world tomorrow before us. They're going to bow down and worship at our feet and acknowledge God loves us. Now, I believe that. If you don't, you'd better repent. you better believe God Almighty is going to back that word up and the Scripture cannot be broken. Well, that's part of my sermon. We'll get into that later. That's just in case. You need a little reminder in advance so you can think along that and then you'll know what I'm about to say when I get to it. But we do need to, to realize there's authority in this universe. We're not dealing with some uh, paper god, uh, some uh, paper giant. We're dealing with a great god. And he created this whole universe. And he's a great lawgiver. And he's the head of this universe. And I'll guarantee you, those who do not recognize that authority, eventually they're going to be burned up in the lake of fire. And before they do, God Almighty is going to make them realize they were the fools and not God. Most people don't realize why there's a third resurrection down after the millennium and that 100-year period. Most people, why would God resurrect these wicked? Because he's going to make every one of them realize that when they fail to qualify for the family of God, they were fools and not God. God Almighty respects himself to the ultimate. And anyone who disrespects God and what he's doing is the one that's going to have to acknowledge he was wrong and not God. God would not uh, respect himself if he let the last thought of an individual justify himself against the great God. So God's going to resurrect all those that reject him after the plan's worked out, as the parable of Lazarus and Rich Man brings out. And they're going to realize what a fool they were to have missed out on God's great family. And when they say, I was a fool, God says, that's right, bye. And every last thought that God deposits will be one that justifies God and does not justify itself. And I don't want to be in that category. Because God Almighty is going to be justified by all. And if any of you have anything that you feel you're going to be justified uh, uh, and not God, just wait. And if you end up in that third resurrection, you'll realize that God means business. You don't flirt with a great God. You don't uh, play games with a great God, and you don't defy him. I believe the scripture for many years says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, he's going to reap. Even farmers know that. You sow wheat, you get wheat. You don't get watermelons. You reap what you sow. And God says, If you sow loyalty, you reap the fruits of it. If you sow disloyalty, you reap the fruits of it. There's no way to, uh, to make the family of God other than the way God is set. You don't get under the back flap, you know. And there's authority in God's church. And I believed in that for 27 years. And I don't deny it. The Bible says Christ is the living head of the church and he's over all things to the church. I believe that. And it's very saddening to me to know that there are people who do not believe that that they have fallen for some of these uh, rumors that Mr. Rader was running Mr. Armstrong. That is defying the Word of God. 
The Word of God says that Jesus Christ is the living head of the church, and he's over all things to it. Now, either that's true or God's a liar. And God Almighty is not a liar. Jesus Christ is over all things to the church. I don't care whether it's AICF or anything else, anything the church of God has to do with, God is responsible for it. When I first heard that, all the, the uh, rebels of 1974 were spreading things about Mr. Armstrong being old and senile. That was way back in 74 when Tom Williams, Dr. Martin, and Ken Westby went off. And I went into all those churches after that, and I said, that's ridiculous. The Bible says Christ is the living head of the church, and it's not up to a man, it's up to God through the man. And I said, uh, and, and repeated, I said, isn't that something? People don't feel God can keep Mr. Armstrong alive. How do you think God must look on that? He and Christ are things that they don't think we can keep our apostles alive. Well, what do they think we're made of? Uh, Geritol? You limit God by thinking he cannot keep a man alive. He's going to keep Mr. Armstrong alive to within three and a half days of Christ's second coming. I've been preaching that for many, many years. If you don't believe that, you'll see it. Because I believe God is bigger than a human being. And God's the author of life. And he can keep a man alive as long as you want to. I was saying back behind these fellows that God has already proved he can keep a man alive 969 years in the person of Methuselah. So Mr. Armstrong has almost 900 left if he needs it. You get the point? Can you imagine God if he said, these people are going to think we can keep our servants alive? What's wrong with them? They think we've been wrinkled out. Some people think when wrinkle came on the scene, God said, what's that? And Christ said, that's a wrinkle. Oh, oh that's done us in. God's the author of wrinkles. He knew uh, before the first wrinkle came on the scene, God knew it was going to come. He wasn't bombed out. It's amazing. You know why, uh, you know, God came to uh, Abraham's tent one time. Now, just place yourself back in this position. And he was talking to, to Abraham, uh, Christ was, and he said, uh, and, and Sarah had her ear to the uh, tent flap. And uh, uh, he said, at the set time, I'm going to appear and give you and Sarah a son. And she laughed in the tent. You see, she, she laughed because she said, if God had only asked me, he consulted me before he made that outlandish statement, he wouldn't have said what he said. Because I could have told him my womb is dried up, I've gone past menopause, I'm too old, and medical science says a woman of this age cannot have a child. If God had only asked me, he wouldn't have made such a ridiculous statement. So Christ said, Sarah, why did you laugh? She said, oh, I didn't laugh. He said, yes, you did. He said, do you think anything is too hard for the eternal? And he proved it. He waited ten more years and then gave them a son. Abraham was a hundred and Sarah was ninety. Now, what would have been your reaction? Had you been back there in the tent with Sarah, would you have laughed? You can test yourself. Do you laugh when we say that God will keep Mr. Armstrong alive because the prophecy says that? Do you laugh? Are you in Sarah's camp or Jesus Christ's camp? She had to learn the lesson that when God says it, he'll do it. I hope none of you have been victimized by that rumor that uh, Stan Rader runs this church. Mr. Rader is under authority. Mr. Armstrong is in authority. Mr. Rader is a very valuable man. He just contacted the officials in Japan about two weeks ago that still want Mr. Armstrong to come to Russia. So he came back, Mr. Armstrong said, God's opened there, we're going in spite of the politics. Now, he's preaching in Pittsburgh today, and then he's leaving immediately for Moscow to set up that trip. Because when the doors open, Mr. Armstrong's going to go. And so uh, in April, they're going to Chicago for a 25th anniversary of the church there. Then they're going down to Egypt and Israel, coming back to have the plane service, to have its uh, whatever the annual check or whatever it is, and then immediately after that, they're going to Moscow. So Mr. Rader is a very valuable man. I don't know of anyone else who could approach diplomats around the world like that and have the expertise, the understanding, the legal knowledge and all, and the ability to research quickly all the background of these officials and approach them in a, in a legal uh, manner with protocol. He's very valuable, but he doesn't run this work. You know, I, I heard this rumor come and, and I said, isn't that something? I checked my Bible, and I said, well, God hasn't changed the word. It still says Jesus Christ, the living head of the church. Now, how, uh, people ought to check their Bible before they open their mouth and say, Mr. Raider's in charge of the word. You always go to the Bible. That's the foundation. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the living head of the church, and he works through apostles first. 
Mr. Armstrong's the only apostle, and God works through him. The rest of us and others are evangelists right on down. Always believe the Bible. Don't open up to rumors. You can't please your God by so doing. I hope that's enough said on that. Back when Dr. Martin and Al Partoon were having problems, I could see their problem. I mentioned that Mr. Armstrong here over in his home in Tucson not too long ago. I said, Mr. Armstrong, back when Dr. Martin, because he was talking about attitudes, how very important the attitude is. He mentioned David's attitude and how God looked on the attitude. If you have the right attitude, God can bless you. Without the right attitude, God can't, because he'd bless you to the lake of fire with the wrong attitude. I said, Mr. Armstrong, I was very alert to the situation back when you were dealing with Dr. Martin and Al Pertoon. I could see that their attitude was absolutely raunchy. And I'd made statements back there to several men. I said, I'm sure that Mr. Armstrong can read an attitude so quickly that when someone touches the knob on the other side of the door going into his uh, penthouse uh, office, that he knows whether the man's in a right or wrong attitude before he comes through the door, and then he's dealing with an attitude. If the attitude is right, he'll consider things further. But if the attitude is not right, why will two discuss things when they're not in agreement? The Bible says two cannot walk together unless they be agreed. So unless they're of the right attitude, Mr. Armstrong will not discuss things further. You're wasting your time. Uh, if two uh, people are of different spirits, of different attitudes, you'll never agree to anything with the Bible as the premise and with authority as the, uh, the basis of that decision. So those two men left. Mr. Armstrong still being used of God. You ought to, everyone who's ever fought Mr. Armstrong is out. And I could name them. There's uh, Dr. Martin, Alpertune, Toon, Ken Westby, Tom Williams' rebellion. There's Raymond Cole's rebellion. There was Paul Royer's rebellion. There was uh, uh, Ted Armstrong's rebellion, Wayne Cole's rebellion, Ron Dart's rebellion. See, they're all gone. God still uses the one he chose to lead this work. When I uh, saw the 74 rebellion, I thought that should be enough to teach anyone, don't make that foolish mistake. And they just kept repeating, like the Israelites, you know, who made the same mistake pe- repeatedly. Time after time after time after time, and all those things were written aforetime for our <laughs> learning day, so we don't repeat those same mistakes. Because we have God's Spirit, and we shouldn't follow the old carnal uh, reaction of the Israelites, who never pleased God, and they continue to limit God. You know, when God rehearsed their history in about Psalm 78, he indicted them twice by saying, because you limited the Holy One of Israel. They could not trust the great God to do what he'd promised. They kept limiting God in their own minds. And that's what you and I, with the Spirit of God and faith through that Spirit, must overcome. That we don't limit God in our own minds. Mr. Armstrong carries the authority of God Almighty. Do you know that? Just like Peter. In the early New Testament, when Ananias and Sapphira lied, you know, Peter didn't say you lied to me. He said you lied to God, you lied to Christ, you lied to the Holy Spirit, and God struck two people dead to prove that was true. And that's after John 3.16. And people have stayed up all night trying to yank Acts 5 out and put it back in numbers. But you still find it in Acts. Because people want to make, make it look like, well, God did things like that in the Old Testament. He wouldn't do anything like that in the New Well, yes, he did. He struck two people dead. And you find that recorded in Acts 5, because they spoke, they, they were speaking to God's servant, but God backed them up with full authority. And when they spoke to Peter, the Holy Spirit took to Christ, who was at the right side of God, and that went right back to the Father, because Christ is under authority. So God backs up his servants to the ultimate. Well, that's a simple thing. I studied that out 27 years ago, just simple as ever. Christ said, if they reject you, they reject me, and they reject the Father that sent me. If they won't hear you, they won't hear me, they won't hear my Father. But if they hear you, they'll hear me and my Father. Because it's an extension of God. So Mr. Armstrong fills an office. And any disrespect toward the office is toward God Almighty. And Mr. Armstrong repeatedly has said that over the years in literature and else. The Bible says it. So anyone who uh, opposes the apostles is not just opposing a man. He's opposing an office. It is of God. And you know what Paul said? Paul, on the one hand, said, I hate old Paul. But he says, I magnify my office. Even Paul himself had to magnify the office God put him in. And if God requires the man that's put in the office to honor the office, then how much more those people are under that office? Well, I wanted to say that as sort of a background because some of you probably heard that uh, uh, Mr. Booth was fired or terminated, uh, and uh, you shouldn't have to know reasons. 
Because Mr. Armstrong carries the authority, and he can do whatever, and he's responsible only to God Almighty and Jesus Christ. Then it's a matter, can you trust Jesus Christ to run his church? Or do you think his hands are tied? But I have seen for 27 years a consistent pattern that God gives that man discernment above anyone in the church, and he can discern an attitude or a lack of savvy very quickly. Now, Mr. Booth went to Pasadena. Mr. Joe DeCotch and others talked to him till 1 o'clock in the morning. They knew, for any was wrong, that he questioned whether or not Christ was working through Mr. Armstrong. He thought he was old and senile and, and you know, that, uh, that God's Spirit was not working through him. Mr. Armstrong cleared that up pretty quickly when he faced him and said, Do I look like I'm old and senile? He said, I may be old, but my mind is alert, and that's where God's Spirit is. See, it's not a matter of dealing with a man. It's a matter of dealing with the Spirit of Almighty God. Do you think it's powerful enough to work through a, uh, a man's gray matter? If his body is not as young as Saul was, or as physically fit as the Mr. Universe, so uh, Mr. Booth was not satisfied with their answers, so they set up an appointment. Mr. Armstrong said, okay, bring him over. So Mr. Armstrong talked to him. First, he just let, uh, asked him, do you think I'm old and, and, uh, and feeble? Uh, and he began to talk. He said, okay, I'll prove I'm not. Then he explained Pentecost, and he explained the primacy of Peter, the primacy of Peter very thoroughly. Mr. Booth said he still couldn't see it. Mr. Armstrong said, well, I have to terminate you. You can't be on the team. You've got to support what Christ puts in the church through the apostles. We must speak the same thing. Well, even uh, teams in this world do not tolerate that. Landry, the Dallas Cowboy uh, coach, does not tolerate one regardless of his talent if he's not on the team. Hollywood Henderson said, you know, he, he told the world, I'm the greatest linebacker in the world. But Landry said, you're fired because he wasn't a team man, you see. Independently, he cost them a game up in Washington because he wouldn't participate, not, didn't make one tackle. Then he had the excuse, well, I, I had the flu and I had uh, a, a bad tender. Well, he should have cleared that up before he went in. You get the point? Can you imagine uh, how successful the Cowboys would be if they did not uh, trust the owner? They didn't believe the owner was really the owner. And that Landry was under the owner and he, and he was the coach. And he sent the plays in for Saul back to call. Can you imagine that, that if, if the members of the Dallas Cowboys out there were... Uh, or of such an attitude, they said, well, we think Stallback's going to have a heart attack before he gets this playoff anyway, so we may as well kind of let down. And if he gets the playoff, they say, well, I don't agree with the call because I think it ought to be an opposite call. They must go in there knowing the owner owns the team. He is the one that uses the coach. The coach sends the plays into the quarterback. The quarterback calls the plays, and all team members must try to make that work. You couldn't remain on the Dallas Cowboy team, the Pittsburgh Steelers, or the Pittsburgh Pirates or anything if you didn't have that attitude of trying to make what the uh, coach in a football, the quarterback, calls as a play. Now, how much more this team? This team is more vital than any football team or baseball team ever thought of being. And we must have absolute confidence that God owns the team, Christ is the coach, and Mr. Armstrong is the quarterback in that parallel, and when he calls the plays, we're there to make them work. We're not there to judge them. We're there to make them work and trust the coach and the owner to modify as they see fit because they're responsible ultimately for their own team. Get the point? That's why God says you must speak the same thing. You must be of the same mind. And Paul even says, you appoint men who will go out and teach the, tra the traditions as we taught them. Not just doctrine, but traditions of the church. So we can all be of the same mind. Not just uh, a doctrine. He said go out and appoint men who will teach what they've been taught and who will teach the traditions that we've given them. So anyone who is on Mr. Armstrong's team must trust Jesus Christ to be in charge and must be one who is out to try to make the, all the plays work, all the programs work, and to lead the people all around the world so we can be united, so we can be on the team, so God can complete the work and we can go to place the final training and get ready for the world tomorrow. So God can only use those who believe Christ is the head of the church and who don't question the plays of the quarterback, so to speak, the one God has put in charge and who supports him fully and therefore encourages the people so they're all of one mind worldwide.
we can't have all this independence, like uh, political parties, you know, and party spirit and all that, which promotes division. Now, that's why Mr. Armstrong had to terminate him, because he said he couldn't agree, even after Mr. Armstrong explained that primacy of Peter way back in the conference very thoroughly. Then it once again went through it and spent an hour and a half. Mr. Booth still said, I can't see it. He says, well, you're still a member. You can be a member and go back and, and be a good member, but you're no longer in the ministry. And if you uh, go back and continue as a faithful member, the door's open, you can come back, and we, you can approach me, and we'll discuss things further. But when you do not support what I have uh, officially put in the church, you can't be on the team. See, most people think so much along the democratic lines. That's what a democracy is short of, demonocracy, in which they demonstrate. And that's what's called all the problems from the time Satan and the demons rebelled and set up division against God. Now, we're the ones that are to help bring all of humankind into one system, one world, so we can live together forever, not as divided groups out here fighting one another. So I wanted to, maybe I got a little more forceful there than I should have, but I just want to make you realize that there is authority in this church, and you should never question the decisions the apostle makes. That's not your decision. That's not your responsibility. I've never done that, because I trust Jesus Christ to be the head of this church. And he's got the counsel of his father. And I don't feel I've got the ability to judge what they do. Neither do you. So I just, by faith, trust God to manage his own affairs. And he says, too, that all of us are less than nothing as compared to him back in Isaiah 40. And he used a little humor there. He starts out by saying, all nations are like a drop in the bucket as compared to me. Then he says, well, now, that's not quite accurate enough. He says, they're like a dust on the balance. And he said, well, they're really less than nothing. So always ask yourself, would God ask you who are part of less than nothing uh, to, uh, how he ought to do something? That'd be rather illogical, wouldn't it? For God to bow down and say, I want to ask you who are less than nothing, a part of less than nothing, how I should do something. Do you believe God's that great? I hope you do. And God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth are my thoughts above yours and my ways above yours. We're here to learn from God. We're to be the clay, and God's the master potter. He's to mold, fashion, shape us. We don't tell the potter how to do it. We, we must be pliable, yielded, malleable, so God can mold, form, and fashion us according to his will. We don't dictate the structure. We, our job is to be yielded so God can mold and fashion us, and we've been called to be on a team to re-educate the whole world. Not to be different, not to be divided, but to be unified under God. So on the one hand, I, I wanted you to know that Mr. Booth is no longer the minister, and he's no longer in the ministry, but he is a, 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 a fully-fledged uh, member and should not be avoided, should not be treated as an outsider in any way, unless he should, I hope, which I hope he doesn't, try to cause any division. But he's not in the ministry. Mr. Jim O'Brien is the officially appointed minister in the air, and I think all of you know that. Now, we need to get in, and my sermon will cover our commission. And God is testing his people today to see who will and who will not be on the team of the apostle. And he gives us that opportunity. And if we prove, we'll go all the way with him, down to a place of final training over in the world tomorrow and have a very elite position in the government of God. Those who don't prove they want to be, God's going to make them wish they had. They're going to go into the tribulation. And there's no ifs, ands, and buts. God's going to remove all the arguments from people who have arguments against what Christ is doing. He's going to take Mr. Armstrong down to Jerusalem and, of course, supervise us down in Petra. He's going to take the Philadelphia era down there. He's going to make it so obvious to those who are left behind that tribulation is about to come on them that they won't have any more desire to use Greek, Hebrew, and some kind of an intellectual... Uh, 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 reason or an excuse to get around authority. So God will lay it bare, but people today must have faith. And you know, the just shall live by faith, but most people want to live by sight. You can't please God by living by sight. You must live by faith. He that comes to God must believe that God is. And God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
And faith is the evidence of those things not seen. In about 1972 on, and especially 74 on, people wanted to see things. They wanted to see answers. They wanted to see reasons. Why is this done? Show me. Show me and show me. And they lost faith. They began to live by sight. They were like Peter out on the water. When Christ came walk on the water and Peter saw him, he says, Lord, if that be you, bid me to come. And he says, come on. Peter began to walk on the water. Then he began to reason. He lost faith. He began to see these boisterous uh, waves coming. And he began to analyze. He said, now, Peter, what are you doing out here? Don't you know you're heavier than water? And science says you ought to sink. See, so he, he, he denied what God, Christ said. Christ says, come. So he began to use human reasoning and logic. And he reasoned against Christ. Christ's decision. He lost faith and began to sink. So he cried out, and Christ reached down, Christ still standing in the water. He still had faith, you see, and he pulled Peter up, and he says, why did you doubt? We're to be peoples that don't doubt God. We're to live by faith. And if you go around looking for this, that, and the other, you'll destroy faith. You must have confidence God's in charge, Christ the head of the church. And he has, has a purpose being worked at below which Mr. Armstrong and others of us have been explained to God's people for 20, 30, and well, in Mr. Armstrong's case, even longer than that, way on back, and it's still consistent. And the only ones who are out of line are those who've stepped out. Mr. Armstrong's still speaking the basic same things. I am. I've been preaching it for 20-something years all around the world. In fact, I uh, started about 23 years ago over in England, 1957. I preached it in England, turned people to headquarters in England, and down to Australia in 59, 60, and 61, in the Philippines in 62, South Africa 63, 4, and 5, and then world tours for nine straight years all around the world, speaking to God's people in all the churches worldwide. And then Ted and some of them did no longer want me to support uh, the leader, and uh, they sidetracked me for a short while, and I was reinstated by Mr. Armstrong when he took over. And uh, so I've been touring again. But I've been saying the basic same thing for uh, uh, over 20 years. Because the Bible is very plain about errors of the church, about a place of safety, about the authority in God's church, about the purpose of this era to introduce the world tomorrow. So I think people ought to sort of place a little credence on that because you see there are people all around the world who are looking to headquarters because God used me to go over there and turn them to headquarters and convince them God is behind it and they're sold on it. When I went down to South Africa to the Feast of Tabernacles a year ago, People down there said, Mr. Waterhouse, we're so thankful now for your three-hour sermons that you gave us. Now, back there, we couldn't appreciate them like we do now. But you so ingrained into our thinking basics so that when these problems began to hit the church, we remained loyal because that we were so convinced of these basic things you taught us that that gave us the strength to go through and plow through all the maze of confusion that were being thrown out in our way. That's something to be thankful for. Three-hour sermons, 15 years late. Better late than ever. You know, God says back in uh, Proverbs 29, verse 18, he says, without vision, a people perish. Now, I hope you all believe that. God says, without vision, you'll all perish. How in the world could you ever be watching and praying always that you be accounted worthy that you escape these things that shall come to pass unless you know what's about to come to pass? And the horrors that are come, going to come upon the scene very quickly. If you're just thinking about today, you'll perish. If you think God's church is some kind of a social club for some kind of a local club activity, instead of a part of a great worldwide work that has a purpose into the world tomorrow, you'll perish. Now, I'm sure Mr. O'Brien will, but every minister on this uh, in God's church worldwide must keep the people in every Sabbath service oriented to Christ, to God the Father, to his apostle, to our commission. So God's people don't lose sight of their calling. Because you have six days out here of influences away from that. On the Sabbath, you must be influenced to your calling, to the great purpose for which God raised up Mr. Armstrong to Philadelphia and spread his churches worldwide and is now training people all around the world for a great purpose. You lose sight of that purpose, you can become carnal, lose faith, and then you get upset when your local club is kind of tampered with. Every man who opens in prayer should always point everyone to God's apostle and ask God to help him so the people every week are conscious of a worldwide work and of the leader and that he needs God's help 
And we need his leadership because we can go no faster than Christ leads the leader. So if you ought to go faster, pray that Christ leads the leader faster. Get the point? And we can only go as fast as the leader leads us, and that will be judged to some degree on how much we are really concerned about Christ leading the apostles. And God can judge your hearts and see who's really on the team, working for it, and is concerned about the world tomorrow, and is really praying, Thy kingdom come, or who would kind of like to let the suffering go on and just have their, you know, local scene continue untampered with. You need to see the suffering around the world of the, of the millions and billions, uh, a uh, world that is writhing in pain, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And this world is not going to be saved, delivered from its ultimate destruction just down the road until Christ sets up a kingdom on this earth, a government that he can work through to change the course of all activities to conform to he and his Father's way. And if we don't want that above all, we don't have any love for these people out here who are suffering in all kinds of ways all around the world who have no hope except for the kingdom of God. So that's what true love is. True love is to obey God, to go his way, and to want everyone else to become a part of that way. Not just ourselves, but the whole of mankind. And to help pioneer the way over the world tomorrow that will make possible the opportunity for all of mankind to worship God, to love neighbor, and to become a part of that family and share in God's power, his way of life, his great holdings, his great wealth forever. That's what true love is. It's not some local thing. It's not... Just so I get it, Lord, we don't care about all the others. Just me and you, Lord. Just get, just you and me, Lord. Just give me all I want. I don't care about all these others suffering around the world and, and pioneering the way over so we can give them the true church of God and get rid of Buddhism, Shintoism, all the false Christianity, and on and on, so we can teach everyone everywhere to love you, to worship you, to honor you, and to know the great God. That's Mr. Armstrong's calling, to point out that the world is worshiping a false God and a false Christ and a false plan of salvation. And our job is to tell them that and tell them there's a, the true God who's going to send the true Christ back to establish true religion on this earth universally and to give everyone the opportunity of fulfilling the very purpose which he's put on the face of the earth. Not some kind of a sentimental Billy Graham nonsense of going out and talking about Jesus. The world only knows the false Jesus. They don't know the true Jesus Christ. We'll get into that a little bit later, what Mr. Armstrong's commission is. People throw out comments that Mr. Armstrong isn't preaching Jesus. That's right, I'm glad he's not. Billy Graham's preaching Jesus, the Pope preaches Jesus, and all the others. But it's a false Jesus! It's that other Jesus Paul warned about! He says, if anyone comes preaching another Jesus, I'm the one I taught. There are two Jesus taught, the false Jesus taught universally. And only a few, Mr. Armstrong, and a few that believe the true Jesus know anything about him. The name does not mean you know the person. There are, there are Mexicans by the uh, thousands that are called Jesus. They pronounce it Jesus. I saw one the other day on some, out in L.A., he's a newscaster. His name is Jesus Hernandez. In English, that's Jesus. Does that mean he's Jesus because he's got the name Jesus? Just because someone comes along pronouncing the name does not mean he knows the true one. And the Bible says if you don't obey God, he that says he knows God and doesn't keep his commandment, he is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So it's not who flaps his tongue and says, I, I preach Jesus, it's who really knows him, and it's preaching under uh, Jesus Christ's leadership, to the world that they're all following a wrong God, a wrong Jesus, a wrong concept of salvation, and then point out the true God, the true Christ, the true purpose, the true plan, and they'd be pioneering the way to be able to teach all of mankind everywhere to conform to that God, to conform to that Jesus Christ, to conform to their way of life. That's our commission. Now, we in this generation, as I said, we need vision more than anyone else because we're living in the climax at the close of the age. We're right in that time when God is about to make the move to bring about the transition from the devil's world to his world, the pivot from the wrong way to the right way. And we're the ones called through whom God is initiating that, getting the announcement out, and then pioneering based on this word, true religion, education. So in the world of all, he enforces that and gives everyone an opportunity to worship the true God, 
by way of true religion and love their neighbor in a true society that is controlled by Jesus Christ through the educators to show them right social activities, right entertainment, right culture, right family life, etc., etc., so they can all have an opportunity of worshiping God and loving neighbor and being a part of that way forever. Back here in Isaiah 46, let's read this, what God says about himself. Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. God here says to Isaiah, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none else like me. Now, that doesn't go with some people, you know, because the the Protestant world doesn't like that. They don't like authority. They want to kind of picture God in their own image, you know, and kind of worship the God of their own creation. But God says there's none else, just him, and he doesn't change. There's only one God. Of course, there are two members of that God family now, but they are in full agreement, and they live a certain way and won't change. The only way you can be right is to be absolutely in agreement with them and aligned with them, and then you're right. If you're off and askew from that, you're wrong. Regardless of how much uh, you feel someone's touched your heart, (laughs) it doesn't matter at all. He says, declaring the end from the beginning. Now, what about that? God says he declares the end from the beginning. God had an end result in mind before he put Adam and Eve on the face of the earth, and everything he's been doing since Adam and Eve has been done toward that end result. That's why God says that vision of people perish. You've got to see God has an overall purpose to build one family, all of whom honor and worship him in the same way, all of whom share life in the same way, all of whom are geared to produce in the same way, to be an overall unit, that works for the same ultimate purposes that will be good for the entire family, to which God can come, Christ will yield the family up to him, and God will be all in all, so that God is the head of a family who shares life and wealth and opportunity and power under his supervision with him. That's his goal. You know, Christ taught that to all of the servants of old. You can turn back here to Hebrews 11. That was always what Christ taught those he dealt with down through the Old Testament. Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. It goes, starts with Abel. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, and right on down. There was one common thing Christ taught all of them, starting with Abel. He showed them the end result. He was indeed declaring the end from the beginning. So we come to verse uh, 10. It's talking about Abraham. What did he look to? It said, Abraham looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. See, Abraham looked to the end result, that city that God is going to bring down out of heaven when there's a new heaven, new earth, that will be the headquarters city of the family. It's a city that's 1,500 miles square at the base, built like a great pyramid. It's got a wall around it. It's about 211 feet high, the wall, made out of pure jasper. It's got 12 gates. There are three on each side. And they're all named, on the one hand, each gate is named after one of the twelve apostles. And also, each one is named after one of the twelve tribes of Israel, to show that from that headquarter city will go God's control out to the twelve tribes of Israel. And those twelve apostles will be kings at headquarters over those twelve nations. And God will exercise rule out to the twelve tribes of Israel, all divine beings in, and then through them to the rest of the commonwealth. They'll be made up of all the Gentiles that are brought into the commonwealth and become permanent down through the thousand years, the one hundred years to follow. So Christ was showing Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, there's one common purpose that my father and I are working on the earth, and that's to build a family that we can share life with forever, and we must have the organized control that will enable us to do that. You read on down in verse uh, 16. It said, but now they, in other words, they refers back to Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all of those outlined up to this in Hebrews 11. He said, but now they desire a better country, that is, and heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Get that? It says, wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. On the other hand, the implication is, if you don't do something, he's ashamed to be called your God. Get the point? Or he wouldn't have had to make the statement. It says, wherefore, God is, is not ashamed to be called their God. Why? For he has prepared for them a city. Get the point? They believed in his ultimate purpose. They didn't doubt it. Therefore, they pleased God. Consequently, he was not ashamed to be called their God. 
On the other hand, if anyone doesn't believe in God's great purpose and does not believe he's working toward the end result that he's going to be in charge of through the holy city, God's ashamed of him because he doesn't really believe in his creator. For God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. All of the first fruits are going to dwell in the headquarter city. They'll be Christ's team. They'll serve under him like a wife, and through them will produce children of the family of God. They will uh, serve under him as a temple, and he will render temple service with them. They'll be under him as a government. He'll render governmental service to them. It'll be his team that he works through. And they're all going to dwell in the holy city at the end of the 1100 years as they structure all the nations and all the citizens of all these nations in one society and the family of God's complete and there are billions in that family and the father transfers the headquarters city down then the father by way of Christ through his team at headquarters out through the 12 gates and down through the 12 tribes of Israel to all the rest of the nations in the kingdom of God. God will lead his family forever by way of that organized structure. So everyone at the time of Abel realized God was working toward an end result of bringing finally all of mankind into one family structure that he can be the head of and have an organized way by which he controls them. For he has prepared for them a city. You know what we're told in Hebrews 13, verse 14? Let's read it. Hebrews 13, verse 14, it says, For here we have no continuing city. Isn't that wonderful? Amarillo will not last forever. Wonderful. Hallelujah. If you, if you, if you uh, think this is the end result, I don't know if you'd even burn the lake of fire. You'd probably be so bad you couldn't even burn. This is contrasted to a city that's made out of pure gold. That's a basic building block, not cast iron, not galvanized iron, not uh, cement with chicken manure mixed in with it, but pure gold. That's the basic building block with every other type metallic, gem substance. God shows that the wall around is made out of pure jasper. That's a lot better than picket, isn't it? Rock fence or a cement fence. Then the gates are made out of mammoth pearls, a great arch here made out of pearl. Isn't that wonderful? And then uh, those twelve, the 12 foundational stones will be made out of pure stones, each one different, and, and, and each one will have a different stone in which one of the, uh, uh, the uh, tribe, the 12 apostles' names inscribed under the gate, and then over each gate will be inscribed one of the 12 tribes of Israel to show everyone as they come and go from headquarters it's behind that particular gate that the junior executives have to do with the control that comes from the Father through Christ, through his government, out through that gate to that particular tribe of Israel. And the one that's directly responsible at headquarters for that nation is one the apostle that's identified in that particular uh, uh, foundational stone. It all dictates organized structure. That's why Christ chose 12 disciples. That's why Jacob was given 12 sons, because God was working toward a family structure that was predicted before he started. That's why God can declare the end for the beginning because he knew where he was going before he started. That's why he'll be successful. Men never know where they're going until they get there. Then they realize they shouldn't be there, but it's too late. That's why we're failures. God has great vision. He knows where he's going before he starts. He knows when he gets here, he'll be pleased to get there. So when he gets here, he says, I'm pleased to be here. It's already too late. We get into the economy. Got 18% inflation this year. We're here, but how do you get out? We shouldn't be here. You agree to that. But what can you do about it? You're already here. See, God doesn't work himself into a predicament like that. He knows where he's going before he starts. He has the end result already declared. He's analyzed the end result and says, I want it. Therefore, he works toward it. And he's big enough to bring it about. So it says he declares the end from the beginning. Then Christ explained to Abel, then Enoch, then Noah, then Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, this is where we're going. The end result of where we're going is a family that's going to be united back to this headquarters from which our Father is going to rule the entire family. You're all called to be with me at the very headquarters of the family of God in this city. So he showed them all their calling, that if they were loyal and faithful, they would end up on his team, his government, living in the headquarters city, ruling and leading the rest of the family, which will be subject to it under the supervision of God, Christ, the government of God at headquarters out through those 12 gates so God can move the entire family forward. He'll have many other cities, but there'll be none as big as headquarters city. It'll be 1,500 miles high. Probably the next highest will be for Joseph, and that'll be probably about uh, 1,200 miles high. And maybe the least city of all for maybe the least of the Gentiles will be about 700 miles high. But they won't complain, or God say, what would you have before? And they said, mud huts. He says, be thankful. <laughs> Get the point? So everyone in the family of God will be thankful. 
but the headquarter city will always stand out because that's where the Father and Christ and the chief executives dwell. And so they'll always have great respect, and all the nations will show great honor and response and allegiance to and obedience to the headquarter city because they'll all know that's where God and Christ and the top executives dwell, from which all the good things come to the Father through a system of control. And they're all being blessed by God. God has a system to bless them all through organized control. We're told over here, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. How many of you obey that? How many of you seek that city to come? Now, if you do, there is no way you can get confused about anything other than one way. Because that city dictates organized structure of the Father out, right down through the twelve gates, who are named after the twelve tribes of Israel, the twelve apostles. And all the nations are going to be subject and walking in the light of that here headquarter city. You don't read that there are many different cities controlling many different ways. The family of God has many different ways in which they can go. There's just one headquarter city that controls the entire family. Then you begin to see that everything God has been doing in the time of Abel has been done toward building one family. Then when you come to this area, you realize Christ is now getting in motion a, set of, a system that will have to do with that one family. And he's setting in motion religion education based on the Word of God that can be spread worldwide after three and a half years of final training so that we can build one world in which everyone worships the same God and everyone loves his neighbor in the same way. Then it will offer or provide a means for all of mankind to live in that one way and prove whether or not they want to join that on a permanent basis. And then they become uh, members of that family outside of headquarters as leaders like a firstborn child. Then their children grow up in a world that's unified to one way of life then every successive generation down through the millennium will have a chance of joining that one family in which everyone worships the head of the family, the Father, in which everyone lives the same way of life. You don't have all kinds of different social uh, programs, different uh, cultural programs, different entertainment that keeps people divided. Same overall customs, social activities, recreation, entertainment for the whole family then God will absorb all the generations of the millennium into that family structure, then resurrect the rest of it who've already proved nothing else will work, and give them 100 years to prove they want to walk in that way and join it on the bottom level as junior members, which are typified by the eighth day, which follows the Feast of Tabernacles, showing they come in last. That's why God wants those on the bottom to approve nothing else will work. So when they come up, God says, nothing else works. You prove that. Now, my way is working. You have to prove you want to join it forever on the bottom level. Then he'll give them 100 years to prove they want to be last. And if someone proves for a hundred years he wants to be last, God can be absolutely assured that person wants to be last. If they didn't, they probably wouldn't last 15 years. The person doesn't want to be last. He's going to stay around a hundred years to tell you he's not, he doesn't want to be last. He would only hang around a hundred years to prove he wants to be last. And for someone to prove for a hundred years he wants to be last, he really wants to be last. No doubt about it. Then all those who come in last, God says, good to have you here last. This is where you're going to be. There's no other way to go. You've already proved there's no other way, so don't try to agitate for a change in the establishment or march on Jerusalem. He's going to make sure those who come in last agree with the whole structure that goes back to the Father. Then good things come to the Father of that structure out to them. They all are going to be happy. The family will move forward under the Father's supervision and share life, wealth, and opportunity to his wife's supervision forever. That's why we're told to seek a city to come. Because if you keep that in mind that God is working toward one family structure, it eliminates all of this Protestant reasoning, satanic reasoning, that God has many different ways, many different churches, and many different avenues to get to the same place. Isn't that stupid? It really is. But the world's stupid because it's under the uh, leadership and the influence and deception of Satan the devil who is an enemy of God trying everywhere in the world to distort what God is doing to prevent people from seeing the purpose for which they are put on this earth. And he's done a real fine job. Mr. Armstrong mentioned me the other day in Tucson. He says, Gerald, he said, I marvel at, at, at Satan. He said, I don't agree at all with him, but I marvel at the individual's ability to have deceived the world like he has and have the tenaciousness to keep going. He says, you have to marvel at someone that has that kind of perseverance. Someone who's been so crafty to deceive the whole world and, and fight so uh, perseveringly to keep the world deceived. Yes, he's, a, he's quite, a decept uh, quite a deceiver. 
He's the wise old serpent, you know. He's very subtle. He's very crafty. He's the prince of the power there. He's deceived the whole world. And we're the ones that are called to undeceive them and give them true religion education. With Mr. Armstrong, through the headquarters church and educational program in Jerusalem, have filled the world with churches of God, filled the world with ambassador colleges, filled the world with imperial schools, filled the world with spokesman clubs, and began every other facet of control to fill the world with proper social activities, cultural activities, entertainment, uh, and so forth, to build one worldwide society based on this word and give everyone a chance to walk in the same way to prove whether or not he wants to join that on a permanent basis. That's our calling. And I'll tell you, Satan is working 24 hours a day to try to keep God's people from seeing that. And his work is to try to jam and, and disturb and prevent God's people from really seeing their calling because he knows if they ever really catch it, they're going to be so locked into the apostle that there's no way of stopping them. So he is out throwing rumors and slanderous remarks around to discourage people, turn them off toward authority, turn them off toward the apostle, so he can yank them out and churn them up and grind them up and destroy them. All right, let's, you know, read about that over in Revelation 21. Here's the city all of those individuals look to. And it says here, I won't read, you, you can read about the structure. It's 1,500 miles high. It's got a wall around it, 1,500 miles on each side, and there are 12 gates. All are named after the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 disciples. Now, if you read here, Commencing in verse 23, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And everyone walks in that way. And the nations of them which are saved. That's all the twelve tribes of Israel, all those supportive nations that have come into the commonwealth. This is the end of God's plan, when all the nations are saved, all their spirit beings. Everyone's a God being, May, uh, populating all these nations. That will be uh, promoted during the uh, millennium and the great white throne judgment period. Here's the end result. And it says, And the nations of them which are saved walk in the light of it. See, they all walk in the light that comes from the Father through Christ and out through those twelve gates the headquarter city. They're all willingly responsive to the Father's leadership down through Christ, his government, through the twelve gates, out to them. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. In other words, they go back and forth representing their nations under headquarters supervision, and the rule goes out and they lead according to headquarters direction. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they, the kings, shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. They don't bring the nations in. That'd be pretty hard for a fellow to put billions on his back and get through a gate. They represent the nations. Therefore, they, as the representatives, bring the glory and the honor of the nation in. They know what their nation is capable of doing. So under headquarters supervision, they receive the instructions, the, the directions, and they go back and lead their nations according to the instructions of the headquarters. So they all are carrying out the uh, directives, the operations, the programs, the projects that the Father through his system at headquarters has delegated to them to go back and initiate through their nations so that the, uh, the combination of all the nations, the composite of all nations, are carrying out the Father's will, which will be good for all of the nations making up the kingdom of God. <clears throat> and they shall bring the glory and the, and the honor of the nations into it. And they, the king, shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defiles, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie. And I'll guarantee you there have been many lies fabricated against Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Rader, and others. And I know there have been certain ones that have been fabricated against me that I know are so outlandish. That's why, you know, as I heard some of those were said against me back in 1974 by Ken Westby, I said, well, I know that is absolutely unfounded. There's no basis for it. Therefore, other things they say might be just as baseless. So I just don't place, place any credibility at all on what comes out of the mouth of an individual. Unless I know it's the apostle, then Christ is responsible to them, and I'm going to be blessed by following that and then trusting the great Jesus Christ to make modifications or changes as he sees fit. And then as he maneuvers the team, I'm still on the team. Get the point? 
and I'm still following the team captain, and then when the team captain is led to victory, I'm there at the victory march because they're going to hold fast. You read back here in 21, verse 8, some of those are not going to be there. This is what the lake of fire is for. It says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and liars. Notice he puts fearful and unbelieving in the same category. Those that are fearful and unbelieving, Christ can run his church. If you can't trust God, you can't please him. I've already quoted the scripture in Hebrews 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe he is. And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And Christ is the living head of the church. Not church is, but his church, his body that has congregations around the world. And he's a responsible one over all of them. So we don't want to end up in that category. Now this city, with all these nations out here that are controlled through the Twelve Gates, reflects, uh, you might say on the surface, the State Department's activities. It doesn't show what we're called to do in the same way. God reveals that uh, a little bit uh, differently. We're, we're called to put uh, society into, into motion that will enable all these nations to worship the same God, that will enable all these nations to share in the same way of life. That's why there's church and state in God's coming government. The State Department will have to do with building all nations under one government so each nation is assigned those jobs that will best fit their talents, abilities, proclivities, climatic conditions, or adjacent to other nations. So when all these nations are functioning under one government, it'd be like a great corporation, each department doing its departmental activities, so when they're all combined, you get the overall whole for which the corporation was raised up. Now, God's a great builder, he's a great producer, he's a great accomplisher, and he wants to share that life with a great family, that, that is, that uh, uh, side of his, uh, his activities with a great family. So he must structure his family to be able to respond to him in producing, in accomplishing, and in building. That's why the kingdom side, our structure, the family of God, is, uh, is designed. So God has a family that has been ordered to departmentalization. So when he puts all these departments together, he has a full complemented corporation of which he's going to be the corporate head to share in his projects, his activities, his production that will be good for the advancement of the family. But God is even more concerned about sharing the way he lives of sharing his uh, social activities, his, his uh, entertainment, his recreation. And don't think God doesn't have those things. You read that God rested on the Sabbath day and was refreshed. You read Christ wrestled all night with Jacob. You see that uh, many times Christ appears with different change of garments. So he changes clothes. He doesn't have a glued on suit. And that's it forever. You read Christ ate with Abraham. Then after he's resurrected, he, he appeared to the disciples and said, Do you have anything to eat here, children? They said, Yeah, we have some fish and honeycomb. He said, Okay, let's eat. So he ate with them. Then after the disciple, after Christ was resurrected, he spent 40 days with his disciples. And Peter said in Acts 10, We did both eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Then he said to his disciples, In the kingdom of God, you're going to sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12, 12 tribes of Israel, and you'll also sit at my table and eat and drink with me. God lives a full, abundant life in Christ, and I didn't come just to give you life, but life more abundant. So God has to also structure his family so he can share life with him. That's where the church side of the government of God comes in, that is going to have to do with building a worldwide system of religion. And in conjunction with that, a worldwide system of education that will control the way by which people are shown to live. And through that structure, God will build a worldwide society so that all citizens of all nations will worship the same God and share life in the same way. And so we're called to be in that area of control. Mr. Armstrong explained that in his book tomorrow, what it will be like. And he shows there's an executive team to work under Christ of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Under them will be church and state. The State Department will have to do with Moses and the ruling arm, working through David, Daniel, twelve apostles, and Paul. That will control the nations as to what those nations do under that supervision. Job will have to do with worldwide building. Joseph, worldwide economy. Noah, getting the people where they ought to be in the way they overspread their inheritance. On the other side, the church division does not have these, uh, uh, you know, four different areas of control. It has just one control because that's to control one way of life. And God must have such consistent control 
that he can promote one way of life so that just Elijah and all those who worked with him have served in his office. You don't have a one like Moses who has the governmental rule and someone else who's department who has the building arm, other than Noah who has the uh, racial arm, and uh, Joseph the economic arm. You just have Elijah and those who have served in his office. So God has a consistent, control way of promoting one way of life to which all of mankind can be geared and through that system build a family, all of whom worship him in the same way and all of whom share in the same way of life. We're called on that side. And we're given further insight over here in Revelation 3, verse 12, as to the calling of the Philadelphia era. It's a very vital area, and that's why God has to be so absolutely sure that he's tested and tried those who have to do with administering that so they are going to speak the same thing. So there can be no inconsistencies promoted in his worldwide society, which in turn would promote a, an inconsistent, divided family. Revelation 3, verse 12, this is the promise to the Philadelphia era. He says, him that overcometh, will I make a pillar. You know what a pillar is? A pillar is a support. Without a pillar, you couldn't put up a temple. Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God? Now, why are we called pillars? And why is the leader called Herbert Armstrong, bright warrior with a strong arm? And why does Christ say, except for this work, he'd destroy everything else? Because he couldn't put the temple together without the pillars. The pillars give structural shape and strength. It'd be like having a tent without tent poles. Wouldn't do you much good. What would you think your neighbors might uh, uh, think of you if you had a big tent lying on the ground, it started raining, you were out on the top of it, they came out and said, why, uh, you, what you need in order not to get wet is a tent. He says, I, you say, I've got one. Your neighbor says, where is it? I'm standing on it. Now, why aren't you under it? I don't have any poles to put it up. Poles become pretty important, don't they? Now, pillars make possible the erection to structural shape and strength of a temple. Now, why does God say the Philadelphia era are like pillars? Why do you raise up a man who has the, uh, the name that depicts the direction, the strength of that direction, a bright warrior with a strong arm? Why does he say without this work back in Malachi, he would smite the earth with utter destruction except for this work? Because we're the ones that have the foundation of all knowledge, the Word of God. We're the ones that are to be used as first to be put together as a team, and then as a team to provide one religion and one educational system for the world, which is going to give structural shape and strength to the family of God. So God can build a, a great family in which the strength of that family is their love toward God, first of all, that is promoted through religious control, and secondarily their love toward one another, which is bound together and strengthened by educational control. So he goes on, he says, now, and he shall go no more out, will always be assigned to headquarters. And I will write upon him the name of my God. Do you think God is going to indiscriminately place his name upon a child to represent him and to bear his authority who does not accurately represent him? Who does not teach exactly as he directs? God is not like a human leader that might tolerate disrespect. God Almighty has great respect for himself, and he's going to require anyone who represents him to have great respect for God and his way of life. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. We've already read about this. Now, we're told we're going to bear the name of that city. The name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Christ doesn't have that name yet. I get that name when the family is complete. The Father comes down out of heaven with the headquarters sitting in a very regal, royal, splendorous ceremony. Christ yields the family up to the Father. And the Father takes over direct supervision of the family. At which time he will bestow a name upon Christ to show why he is second in charge. So the name will probably include a lot of things, but it will have to include this to reveal that he's second in charge because he promoted the entire family and yielded up the Father. Therefore, he is qualified to be under the Father to manage the whole family. So the name will always keep the family of God mindful as to why Christ is where he is and the only one qualified to be supreme under the Father's supervision. He's qualified to be where he is because he promoted the entire family 
yielded up to the father and therefore is qualified to remain in that position to supervise the family under the father's supervision. So we're the ones who are going to bear three names. The Philadelphia Air will bear the name of the father, the name of the headquarter city, and Christ's new name. And those who bear those three names are going to be absolutely loyal. They will not be to any degree wanting to promote liberalism, division, inconsistencies. They will work under a team captain who will work under Elijah, who will work under Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, under Christ the Father, and we will teach what the Father teaches us. And we will do it with strength. And the Father then can rely upon us to teach from New Jerusalem what he teaches us to the rest of the family and put strength in the family and not modify not introduce incongruities or inconsistencies or water down his way. That's why God so hates liberalism. If God were to let one degree of liberalism creep into the educators, then you project liberalism, one degree of liberalism, over a billion years, you destroy God's control over his family because that gap gets wider and wider and wider. Pretty soon God would lose control of his family because of a liberal orientation. Why well, has a man not called liberal slim but Herbert Armstrong, a bright warrior with a strong arm that will fight for God's way, fight to hold on to the Word of God, fight to obey God's government in spite of all that Satan throws at him. So God can be sure of the leader and all those who orient to him and on his team that these individuals will teach my way with strength and I will never have to be dis uh, concerned to the least degree that they would ever repeat what Satan, the devil, and the demons did and gradually lose sight of me and their need for me and rebel against me as a third of the angels did. God's got to be sure of that. So here are Philadelphians who are promised they're going to bear three names. So when the Father's here with the headquarter city, we're in the headquarter city, we'll see our Father in action. He'll be the leader of the family, the active head of the family. We'll see that Jesus Christ fully supports his Father as though the two are one then we will take that beautiful example under their wise supervision and put it into group action that we will have been doing for 1,100 years, putting God's will into action in Jerusalem. And then when it meets Christ's approval, teach it to the rest of the world. As a result of 1,100 years of that, we'll be in the headquarters city. The Father will be in charge. We'll see that Christ fully supports his Father as though the two are one. Then we will continue by putting that example into group action under their wise supervision and then when it meets their approval, not before, then we'll be given the blanket authority to teach out through those twelve gates to the twelve tribes of and through them to those that were Gentiles until the entire society has received uh, the teaching and the example and the leading of what the Father has revealed at headquarters that Christ is fully supported and we fully supported and then we teach others who fully support what we teach them right on down until full support comes from the junior members right up through the to that society to the Father, so the entire family responds to the Father. And this is a very critical area. God knows that he's got to be sure of the group that he uses to teach the rest of the family how to worship him and love neighbor, that we will do it with strength and not water down and erode his control over his family, nor destroy their confidence in his leadership. That's why Satan is is loud. God allows people to come around and see whom he can turn off against believing in the father of the family to where they would not support God Almighty like they ought. And that's a serious offense. And if you want to be a member of this team, you're going to have to prove to God that you trust him, that you trust Jesus Christ as the one they put in office. And to overcome all the onslaughts of the devil to try to destroy your confidence and support. And I'll tell you, brethren, those that don't believe that are going to be forced into tribulation and you don't have any choice. Then you'll either prove you'll be loyal by giving your head on the guillotine and acknowledging you were wrong, and you won't make that mistake again or you're forever gone. Now, God wants you to be saved, but he's not going to think for you. He says you must choose life or death. Then God says, I want you to choose life, but you've got to choose. I won't prevent you from choosing death, but you've got to choose. But I want you to choose life. God wants everyone he's called to choose to be members of the Philadelphia era. But he knows that a certain percentage is going to allow everything in the world to cloud the issue and not hold fast to the apostles. So he's got an alternative. He's going to shove them in the tribulation and give them a chance then to learn the big dose 
that they made a gross mistake and proved to the point of giving their heads they'll never make that kind of mistake again, then they can testify against Satan's system through the Pope and the beast in Europe. On the other hand, put Mr. Armstrong and the Philadelphia here on the map down in Jerusalem and Petra and prove to the point of death not only have they put God's work on the map as opposed to Satan's work, but they have proved they will fully agree with the way Christ is going to re-educate the world through Mr. Armstrong and the Philadelphian era. So when he resurrects him, there's no contention, there's no uh, disagreement of those, between those who come in via the Laodiceans with those who are the educators of Philadelphians. Otherwise, Christ would be promoting division. He said, any kingdom divided against itself will not stand. And if God brought anyone to the government of God that disagreed with the way he's running things to others, he'd have a divided government and promote only a divided kingdom. So he's got to make sure they all agree with what he's doing. So for us to be pillars, we've got to be made strong. That's why the testing, that's why God allows so much to hit the Philadelphia area, because he's got to make them strong. They've got to be pillars. Now, you've got to understand the background as to why God does this. See, the Satan has come along made religion sort of a weak need thing, you know, like all you've got to do is accept the name. Just like it's easier to become a, a, a born-again Christian than it is to buy a pair of shoes. A lot cheaper. Can you imagine how uh, successful Sears and Roebuck would be if it ran its operation based on the concept people have of God and his operation? Now, how long do you think Sears would be successful if the president of Sears and Roebuck said all people have to do to become a permanent member of Sears and Roebuck and share all the benefits of Sears is to accept the name of the vice president. And we don't care what you believe. You can believe in Washington Auto, Kmart, Monkey Wards, anything else. All you've got to do is accept the name of the vice president. It wouldn't last any time. But that's the way Satan has palmed off God through Protestant religion. All you've got to do is accept Jesus' name. doesn't care what you believe. You can believe in law, you don't have to believe in law. You can believe in policies, you don't have to believe. You can believe in doctrine or no doctrine. You can believe in government or no government, but just accept the name of the vice president and you shall live in our family forever. Wouldn't work in human circles, would it? Then you're, you're, uh, if you believe that, you're trying to make a Sears and Roebuck being uh, more intelligent and more crafty and more responsible than God. Because Sears would not allow what most people uh, that have been infected by by Protestantism, think God is doing to build a family. That doesn't jive with the Scriptures. That says, too much tribulation shall we enter the kingdom of God. That you have to strive and overcome. That broad is the way and wide is the gate that leads to destruction. But narrow is the way and straight difficult that leads to eternal life and few there be that find it. Well, most people fall for this... Uh, uh, satanic approach said, boy, it's easier to become a Christian than most anything else. Just accept the name. That's what Billy Graham and others uh, expound. Well, I'll tell you, there's no trying and testing in that, but there is in God's plan. And God is trying and testing his people now to see who will be on the team and who will not. First, God is concerned about a team. Who ever thought of a team being perfect before they became a team? See, some people look at the church and say, we don't see all this love and all. Well, what God's doing now is putting together a team. When he's sure of the team, he takes his place to final training, and there the perfection is promoted. That's where the spots, the blemishes, and the wrinkles are removed when we're together for the last three and a half years, when God blocks Satan's broadcasting where it does not penetrate the area of Petra, because those that go there have already overcome the devil, and God knows that the devil's influence could never turn them aside, so remove it so his spirit has full flow and he can promote through his people his way, so through them he can introduce his way in the world tomorrow, not part of his way, and, 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 a, and a lot of Satan's way still injected into it, but to have made the woman perfect by the time Christ comes to marry her, to have removed the spots, the blemishes, the wrinkles. So God has to test and try to make sure all those who go with Mr. Armstrong to final training have already committed themselves to the kingdom of God and would not look back for any reason. And I'll guarantee he's going to test everyone to make sure that they, that they meet those requirements. And then that's when the team is going to be made perfect. You cannot become very perfect as long as you're involved in this world society. Australians are still enslaved to a great degree to the Australian society. 
South Africans to the South African society, Canadians to the Canadian society, Americans to the American. So there's no way you can overcome a society when you're still a part of it. What God wants the people to do is say, we want to completely come out of this society and completely learn your way. And he says, okay, if I can see that you really mean that, I'll take you out of all these holding patterns, and I'll take you as one group to Petra, or to a place to find us, and you could already go on Petra, so go ahead. But the only indication in the Bible is Petra. You don't have any indication otherwise. It's an absolute guess, guess otherwise. I'd rather go by indication than wild guesses. <laughs> but some people get caught up because they, they you know, they, they want to guess. They, the guessing games are for television. You can go a long way on guessing games to guess the right thing, but you get a temporal reward. So God will take all those who want to go all the way out of these holding patterns to one place, and he'll absorb them into one way. So that by the end of the three and a half years, the Australians are no longer going to the Australian society, the South Africans to the South African society, or Canadians to the Canadian society, but they've all become one. And then we reflect God's society by the end of the three and a half years, then we become the core around which God builds the world tomorrow. As we transfer up into Palestine, the, the program with the churches, the schools, the colleges, the children, the family units and all, and then God delivers these Israelites out of captivity of the land of Palestine. are going to come up, bow down to our feet and say, now we know God loved you, and then we'll teach them to conform to that way and build them into that framework of control. They, in turn, will become an example to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles, nation by nation, will turn until God finally spreads this program worldwide and finally has a worldwide society that is his society, finally, and it's completely his and no longer the devil's. Then in that society, he'll build the generations of the millennium to come. Then he'll resurrect the rest of the dead who've only known the devil's way, and they'll come up into God's world and have 100 years to prove whether or not they want to join that way forever. Then when God finishes the family, he has one family. It's all based on his word. Everyone in that family relates back to a system of religion to the father of the family. Everyone in that family relates to that society, to the way of God, back to the Father, whose way of life it is. Then God can come down and lead that family and have it all geared to his way of life. So they continue to worship him on an ever-increasing basis. They continue to grow in this way of, of life that God's the author of, and they come to love it more, they come to love their neighbor more, they come to love their father more, and that will guarantee the future of the family. When a family is geared to the Father in a in a going relationship of love and geared to the neighbor in a going relationship of love, that's going to guarantee the future success of the family. Because you don't turn around to hit, hurt someone that you're going in love towards. Only when you begin to grow out of love that you think of measures or means by which you try to rid yourself of that one you don't like as well or you're beginning to hate or resent and you want to get rid of. You see, way back when God created angels, and he assigned one-third of them to this earth and put one of his top executives over these angels. This executive called Lucifer began to look away from God, not overnight. This took many, maybe thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, maybe a million or so. We don't know the time limit. But gradually, Lucifer began to look away from God. He began to trust in himself. The element of vanity began to be generated in his thinking. That's when vanity came on the scene. So he began to elevate himself out of context because he was looking at what he was doing, he lost sight of God. Finally, God diminished in his thinking, and he elevated himself until he began to rely on himself more and more and on God less and less. Eventually, he became competitive in his own mind toward his Creator and began to want to do his own thing. Now, God didn't allow that. So he poised the minds of the angels under him so they could boot the old man, the old senile man up in spiritual Tucson out and take over and run the operation the way they thought was better. You'd better believe that, too. God is letting his apostle go through what he went through in a very small degree so we learn and can empathize with our Father as to what he went through when a third of his angels rebelled, tried to boot him out of office and take over and run things their own way. And he lost a third of his angels, his close friends, and they turned into bitter enemies that tried to boot him out without mercy. And we've seen a repetition of that several times when men get caught up and think they know more than the apostle, and they want to boot the apostle out and take over and run things their own way. So it's a, the same rebel that rebelled against God that's behind all the rebellions that try to boot God's apostle out and take over. So we can really understand, relate to, and empathize with our Father and Jesus Christ and what they went through. So he has a family that understands when he makes that final judgment 
in the final sentencing of Satan the demons, we completely concur with the severity of why he has to do it. You don't learn something by book learning alone. You learn by experience. So God lets us experience things to be good teachers. So here Lucifer then turned the angels under him against God. See, he'd been at God's throne as a covering cherub. They'd been out in the field. In other words, they were in Amarillo, and he was in Pasadena. Get the point? So he came out and said, Now, I heard that. Oh, you did? Well, boy, uh, thanks for telling us. If you hadn't told us, we wouldn't have known. And these angels began to get caught up in what Lucifer told them until they fully believed that Lucifer was, was better for them than God was. And if they would only back him up and boot God out and put him in office, everything would go along better. It's amazing how people fall in that trap. I hope none of you said this, but I'm sure the people around, some people have heard this, or, uh, you know, uh, heard what Mr. Armstrong has done in, in two or three cases, in terminating men. They'd say, oh, Garner Ted would never do anything like that. He has great love. Balderdash! Garner Ted fired Jack Martin the other day, who was in charge of his magazine. Wayne Cole quit because Ted did not go through the board of directors. And they said, well, you were supposed to do this to the board of directors that hired Jack Martin. He says, I'm not going to work through a board of directors. I'm in charge. And they said, no, you're not. He said, yes, I am. He says, I'll leave you because all you worldwide Church of God people are, are the ones that cause me problems. So I'm going out and have my own evangelistic work and get my own new people. So the whole organization's falling apart. That might disappoint some people that might be saying, I want to join Ted. He may not be there when you get ready to join him. You won't know whether you're going through a board or by the board and who you're following. That organization, it's, it, it's spawned in rebellion and it only can vote, promote further rebellions. You can't take a lot of dissidents who can't stand government, who won't cooperate, lump them together and not have an explosion. See, the devil's way will never work. Rebellion never produces something good. You can't get fresh water out of a salt spring nor figs off a thistle bush, and you can't get peace and harmony out of rebellion. Now, Ted's the one that said several years ago when the 74 rebellion came along, and then when uh, Doctor, uh, when Mr. Hunting and Richard Plachet went away, Ted said, it's all going to fall apart. It's going to splinter and further split, split and splinter, and finally it's all going to fold up. He's the one that predicted that, and that's happening to him. Oh, he wrote many strong letters back uh, when, uh, when Tom Williams and Ken Westby and the others rebelled, and even later when Charles Hunting and Richard Plachet went off. He predicted exactly what happens. Then he rebelled, and sure enough, it's happening. But that, I brought that out just to let you know, even Ted fires people. Anyone that's trying to be in charge of an operation uh, has to eventually fire someone if he's working against the organization. You just can't uh, tolerate everyone doing his own thing. Even President Carter comes to realize every now and then you've got to fire someone. You just can't let everyone do your own thing, even if you're born again. Because they work against being born again. So here, way back when Lucifer then made up his mind and poisoned the angels to boot God out, then they took everything they'd learned from God, the power, the office, and everything that had come from God, and they turned it around, harnessed it up to use it against God to boot him out of office. But they realized he wasn't old and senile when he got up there. He just came back with great force. He stood up and said, you think I'm old and senile? And he booted them back down to earth. And boy, they were sure then he wasn't old and senile, but still wrong. But he wasn't old and senile. They, they'd misjudged there, but boy, they were right in his mismanaging things. But see, God's still in charge, and they're still the enemies that are all confused. Get the point? So God had a problem on his hands. He lost a third of his angels. He could not restore credibility in the think of those demons because Satan has so poisoned their minds that their minds were locked shut against God. And to this day, they've, they've remained bitter enemies to God. So God made up his mind when they rejected his government authority, that he could never allow that again. So he had to make sure he'd have means by which that could never occur again. So the issue, first of all, the test and the big issue is who will obey God and the, that, God's government and be subject to his authority exercised through that government. That's the whole issue because that's where Satan and the demons went off. They rejected God's government and therefore refuse to submit to his authority. Now, that's the critical issue. That's why government is such a critical issue in God's plan. 
that God is testing, the family he's going to build is going to have to prove it will be subject to his government and respond to his authority exercised through it. But now to guarantee that, he has two controls that will guarantee anyone who comes in that family will always remain obedient to his government and submit to his authority. And that's where we come into the picture. He, he thought out a master plan. He said, the only way I can be sure that I never see any others rebel against my government and reject my authority is to make sure there's a relationship established between me and them and one another, that is, they among themselves, which will be such a bond that they will continue to grow in love toward me and grow in love toward neighbor, therefore continue to respond to my government, submit to my authority to greater and greater degrees, which will guarantee I never see another rebellion in the history of eternity. So he designed a master plan. And the, the first prerequisite is to build a family that will be subject to his government and authority. Then to be sure that they will be, within this framework of control, he says, they must all relate back to me in a relationship of love. And they must all be bound together in a relationship of love, because if Lucifer had not begun to get uh, a wrong orientation toward his creator, he would never rebelled against God and rejected his government. And he would not have launched that attack on God had he really loved the other two-thirds of the angels, because he would have realized that his rebellion would have hurt those other two-thirds who were still serving God faithfully. And they were hurt because when a third of the angels rebelled, God had to stop the whole universal operation. And those two-thirds who were still faithfully serving could no longer serve in the way they were doing and willing to do. So when Lucifer and the angels rebel, they hurt their God and they hurt their neighbor. So God has two great controls now to guarantee that can never happen again. First, the relation, the control that builds everyone into a relationship with him of love. And second, they're the control that builds everyone together in a relationship of love. So he builds a great family that will always be responsive to his government and subject to his authority because they will so love him and they'll be in a growing relationship of love with him. They'll always grow in, in their concept of his greatness. They'll see his greatness unfold before them more and more, and therefore they'll stand in awe of his greatness, and they'll continue to grow in love toward the neighbor, so their, their love toward their neighbor and their neighbor toward them is increasing, and therefore no one in that whole family structure would ever think about turning against the father or against neighbor, because they love the relationships that they share so profoundly, and that those relationships are increasing. Christ mentioned it over here in Matthew 22. He shows the whole premise of God's family has to do with two great commandments. And those two great commandments are absolutely vital to ensuring that a family is built that will never reject his government and refuse to submit to his authority. So here in Matthew 22, commencing in verse 36, <clears throat> the young man came to Christ and says, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, you shall love the eternal your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. Now ask yourself, why should God even have to define that? Wouldn't you think anyone the great God creates would automatically do this? Well, maybe God assumed that until he saw a third of his angels turn and violate this, which in turn proved it is not absolute that just because the great creator creates someone, that someone will always stand in awe of him and love him on an ever-increasing basis forever, which should be the case. But when a third of the angels rebel, that proves that's not an absolute. So now God has to find the means to which you must concur or respond that makes it an absolute. Get the point? So Christ said, this is the first and great commandment. Why? Because that's where Satan and the demons went wrong first. That was the first error they violated, the relationship toward their God. That's the most important. When they began to turn away from God and trust in themselves, that was their first big error. And then in so doing, they didn't consider the impact their rebellion would have on the other two-thirds of the angels. So Christ said, now the second is likened to it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Get the point? The first area where the angels went wrong under Lucifer was against their creator, and that hurt their neighbor because the other two-thirds of the angels suffered as a result of what their rebellion had, had done in, in, in bringing havoc to the universe. So Christ said in verse 40, on these two commandments, hang, H-A-N-G, hang all of the law and the prophets. Everything else has to do with these two relationships. 
he says, on these two commandments hang, H-A-N-G, hang all of the law and the prophets. The rest of the Bible hangs on those two. The two are further magnified by the ten. The first one says, love God with all of your heart, might, soul, and being. The second says, love your neighbors yourself. Then the Ten Commandments further spell it out to show you in ten broad ways how you begin to love God and love neighbors. The first four of the Ten Commandments show you in four broad ways how you begin to love God. The last six in six broad ways how you begin to love your neighbors. Then the Bible further magnifies... Let me glue this thing back together here. The Bible further magnifies the ten and becomes a foundation on which God will build a family that has this relationship, first, of love toward him, and secondarily of love toward neighbors. Why? Because that's where the angels went wrong. God has to be sure that can never happen again. So he's got the controls to build a relationship that will absolutely guarantee no one would ever reject his government or fail to submit to his authority. Because they're growing in love toward him, not out of love into hatred, and they're growing in love toward their neighbor, not hatred toward their neighbor. And therefore, they want to continue to share in the same way that is benefiting everyone concerned. So Christ said, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. So this becomes the foundation on which God's going to build a family. Now what, what about the prophets? He says the prophets hang on these two, because the prophets forecast the whole thing, that mankind by rejecting God is going to end up in a situation he can't deliver himself from. And the prophets have that twofold message that if you obey God, you reap the blessings. If you rebel against God, you reap the curses. Quite a foundational book. So as God builds a family, into this relationship of love toward him and love toward neighbor, they will all know beyond any shadow of a doubt that the only way to derive the blessings everyone wants is by following the Father. That there is no way to derive the blessings going contrary to God. So God is giving his future family 6,000 years to prove you cannot rebel against God and get the results you want. That's why we're cursed in our cities, our nations, our economies, and everything else because we're trying to derive the benefits we want by going contrary to God. What a beautiful foundational book that has all the necessary beginnings of relationship toward God and toward neighbor with the absolute evidence within this foundational knowledge book that there's only one way to the blessings everyone wants to share, and that's by following the Father. So there'll never be the experts. You see, the intellectuals in God's family that says, I think there's a way to gain these blessings easier than the Father's leading. I know a shortcut. Join me, back me up, and let's go out here and let's pursue this way, and we'll derive the same benefits with less effort. That I said, well, you, you, that sounds like a good idea. You've got degrees, haven't you? And on and on, and then that promotes division in God's family. So God's got to be sure that no one in that family even begins to believe that there's a way to gain the same benefits or greater benefits by going contrary to the Father. He wants a family that knows you must follow his leadership to share in what only he can provide. And only God authors blessings. The devil authors curses. That's why the human race, when it turned to follow the devil, has been reaping curses for 6,000 years because Satan, when he rebelled against God, turned in the opposite direction away from God who is the author of blessings. And therefore, he began to promote the way of curses. And the human race, by following him, has been reaping what that way produces, curses. What a foundational book. A family that will never, ever fall into that trap of feeling there's an easier way to derive as, as many or greater benefits than the Father's way. And uh, they'll always realize beyond a shadow of a doubt that only the Father's way produces the result we all want to share together. What a foundational knowledge book. Now, God has raised up a system to use this foundational knowledge book to build a worldwide society. And that's where you and I come on the scene. This um, book Mr. Armstrong passed out during the Feast of Tabernacles tomorrow, what it will be like, he explains in there about church and state. And on the state, the church side of activities is Elijah. He's going to be the chairman of the team. God initiated through Elijah the beginning of a program toward building a worldwide society, and in that worldwide society, a worldwide family, all of whom will worship him and love their neighbor. So he raised up Elijah at the precise right time to train an expert when all the Israelites were worshiping Baal. And they were all convinced Baal was God. 
So God raised up Elijah and made sure the name was given Elijah. Elijah means, you know what the name Elijah means? It means the eternal is God. Now, why did God make sure the man's name was Elijah, which means the eternal is God? Because he wanted to send that man to the Israelites, all of whom thought Baal was God, and convince those Israelites that they were worshiping the devil and not the true God, and bring about repentance, and in so doing, train a leader that will have to do with chairmaning a division of his coming government to turn the whole human race away from worshiping the devil to worshiping the true God. There are two men that are going to be given the power to stop the rain that rain not during the days they're prophesying, which is three and a half years, just like Elijah. They're going to be given power to send fire out of heaven. That'll stop anyone arguing on it and consume their enemies. They'll be given power to, to send plagues as often as they choose. And if anyone tries to hurt them, they will be killed in like manner. That'll kind of knock in the head all this sentimental gooey religion of Satan the devil that God just loves everyone. Well, he does one says, but he just, you know, they, they're, what they're really saying, God loves always. doesn't matter what way you go, God loves it. No, he doesn't. He hates any way other than his way because it's destructive. But he loves the human race because he put them here to become his family, but only in his way. So there is a time and an order by which he can show everyone, here's the way you must prove you want to live to finally join my family. So there is a time uh, frame in which everyone will have an opportunity of coming into that understanding and a chance of qualifying for the family of God down through the 1,100 years to follow. So God raised up Elijah, and then Elijah went to the Israelites. And the Israelites were all convinced now that Baal, which means Lord, see, that their Lord was right, and their Lord was Baal. So Elijah came along and said, now, Baal is not God. And they said, oh, yes, he is. We all believe he is. Therefore, the majority is always right. Elijah says, okay, we'll prove today who worships the true God. And since you're many, you prove whether or not Baal is supreme. So you go first. So they began to implore Baal. There was no response. You know why? Because God's supreme and he restrained the hand of the devil who in turn did not have the power, the means, to work through his uh, prophets. So these uh, prophets of Baal implored Baal all morning. And about noon, nothing had happened, so Elijah began to really stick the knife in. You know, the sword in began to twist it a little. He said, uh, he said uh, maybe you boys ought to shout a little louder. Maybe Baal's hard to hear. He said, oh, that may be it. So they shouted louder. No response. He said, maybe he's on a far journey. They shouted louder. Nothing happened. Then he said, they tell you what, boy, he might be on the John with the do not disturb sign out. You think I know what I'm talking about? You check the Revised Standard Version, and there are certain versions that translate that Hebrew to show that Elijah got right down in a crude manner and, and really stuck the knife in, and he said, maybe he's on the John with the do not disturb. And so they shouted louder. No response. By the end of the day, Elijah built an altar with the twelve stones representing the twelve tribes of Israel. He dug a big trench all around the altar and then filled it with barrels of water. He wanted to eliminate any excuse of a, of a coincidental prayer fire just coming through. Then he prayed a short 30-second prayer or less, and God consumed the sacrifice. And all the people then were convinced that Elijah represented the true God, and they in turn repeated the meaning of his name twice when they said in 1 Kings 18, the eternal is God. The eternal is God. They didn't say Baal is God. They said the eternal is. So God, through Elijah, convinced them they were following the wrong God and they ought to turn to him. So he trained Elijah to fill this most important office through that experience of leading a team that will turn the whole human race away from worshiping the devil to worshiping the true God, from worshiping the false Savior to worshiping the true Savior, the true Jesus Christ. So God established an office. That's why Elijah will be the chairman of the team. Then he raised up John the Baptist, and he prepared him to prepare the way for Christ's first coming, and he came in the office of Elijah. You see, when someone serves in someone's office, then God knows when he's done it long enough, he can make him permanent, and he'll continue doing what he's already proved he'll do. So to make sure Elijah has the team working with him and will follow his chairmanship, the first one that was trained to fill his office, to work under him, was John the Baptist, who came as Elijah, in the spirit and the power of Elijah, preparing for Christ's first coming. So when he's resurrected, he's already proved he will fully occur, concur with Elijah because he's worked in his office. 
to help him do the same job Elijah's going to have to do in the world tomorrow, uh, pointing out the true Christ as opposed to the false. When John came on the scene, he pointed out the true Savior, and he said, this is the true Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, because the world was worshiping a false Jesus. Jesus means Savior. They're worshiping Nimrod, calling him Jesus as they do today. Now, in this day and time, he's raised up another man to prepare the way for Christ's second coming, put him in the office of Elijah, and he comes in the spirit and the power of Elijah. He's been serving that office for about 52 years already, so that when he's resurrected, changed the spirit, not resurrected, well, in the sense, be dead three and a half days, then God knows the man will work under Elijah in his office because he's been doing it for 52 years, plus what remains in the future. And his job is not to go out and preach this Jesus of the world any more than Elijah's job is to go out and preach Baal, the false Lord. Now, John the Baptist come along and put a stamp of approval on what the world was in worshiping as the Savior. He came out to point the true Savior. Now, Mr. Armstrong's job is to come along and tell the world, you're worshiping a false God, and you're worshiping a false Savior, and you don't understand the true plan of God. Now, I'm the one that understands the true God and the true Christ, the true plan of God. Now, when you understand this, you'll understand how profound are his visits with world leaders. You heard the tape, I hope, here, when Mr. Armstrong spoke to those diplomats in China. There were 76 countries represented there. 76 countries through their diplomats. You know what Mr. Armstrong told them? He said, no religion on this earth knows the true God. He says, no religion on this earth knows the true Christ, and no religion on this earth knows the true plan of God for mankind. But he says, I do. And he says, I'm writing a book which is entitled, A Voice Cries Out, that explains this. And he says, if any of you men want a copy of this, I usually charge a price. But if you'll see me after this meeting, I'll give you a copy gratis. But if you fail to request one after this meeting, you can always write to our world headquarters in Pasadena, California. We'll send you a copy. Most people don't even relate to that because they don't understand what the commission of Elijah is. It's to tell the world you're worshiping a false god and a false Christ and a false plan of salvation. And then to begin to tell them what the true God's all about, what the true Christ is all about, and what their true plan is all about. But you don't tell them the whole story all at once. You, you plant the seed. And you have the three and a half years of final training when you have a satellite system from Petra and continue to amplify this down to the second coming of Christ out in the world tomorrow until the whole world comes to see it. And the whole world has to concur. It's only as a witness today. It's not to convince the world yet. It's a witness so they can't say they hadn't heard. But it's being told, like Mr. Armstrong said, I talked to the second vice chairman in China one of the three top men of China. He said, I explained about the coming United States of Europe. I explained about the Catholic Church's role in bringing it about. He, Mr. Armstrong said he smiled disbelievingly. Mr. Armstrong said, I'm just telling you, I don't have to convince you. You will come to see it fulfilled. See, that's a witness. He didn't go very because he didn't say, oh, I'm, I failed. I didn't get him to bow down except Jesus. Throw away his chopsticks, throw boot in the China Sea, and tell all the Chinese have all been wrong. That's going to be done way in the world tomorrow. But he's planting the seed. Then from Petra, he can beam in via satellite system and tell those Chinese leaders of the world tomorrow, did you read my book? It's still going to happen. And keep that message going out until they come to believe it. You know, people, I think Ted and others, you know, don't understand God's plan. Well, Ted does to a degree, but he doesn't want to accept authority. That's why he doesn't want to agree with what that authority says. They think Mr. Armstrong over there and preached Jesus like Billy Graham would, and like Norman Vincent Peale would, and like the Pope would. That's the wrong Jesus. They hear enough of that nonsense. It's turned the world off. It's just got sentimentalist. But it hasn't changed the course of the world. We're not going to change the course of the world. We're only preaching the true message as a witness unto all nations. And then the end of this age is going to come and Christ is going to come back with power and he's going to make the people realize they've heard from him through his messenger. There are going to be no ifs, ands, and buts. So God raised Mr. Armstrong up to, fill, to fit in that office preparing the way for Christ's second coming. 
to come in the spirit and the power of Elijah, pointing out the true God, the true Christ, as opposed to what the world is worshiping, just like Elijah did in John the Baptist. And then when he joins Elijah, he'll have a team that will be the, the team based on the Word of God, by way of which Elijah, through Mr. Armstrong, will have the mechanics of both religion and education, by which he can change the course of conduct on the earth from following the devil to following God, and teach men everywhere how to worship the true God and how to love neighbor, and begin to build mankind into this framework of life, and absorb the generation until God builds a great family that he comes to and will lead forever. Now, back here in, in Malachi. Let's read a few of these. They're absolute prophecies. There's no ifs, ands, and buts about them. I've been preaching for 20-something years because the Bible doesn't change. You know, it's amazing. You just go out and preach it, and, and a lot of people disagree. I had Al Portune one time call me in his office. He said, uh, he said, Gerald, you're all screwed up in your head. We no longer teach those things. You're preaching. See, they were caught up toward Mr. Armstrong. He said, unless you let Dave Ant and me give you some spiritual therapy, you're gone. Well, I respect the office. didn't believe the thing he was saying. Because God has so convinced me by turning people from England, Australia, the Philippines, South Africa, all around the world to, to God and Christ and his headquarters and his apostles. So that was done with such power and such force and such signs following. Of course, it would take me all day if I could remember it to even go into the numerical sign patterns that envelop the earth as God led the work into different parts of the world through me. And, of course, they used to call me the numerics kid because... You know, they, they kind of did that in a way to discredit Al Platoon Ted Armstrong and began to throw that out to kind of make it look, you know, in a discrediting manner. For a long time, though, they believed that it was a sign that God was confirming what he was doing, because signs were to follow. And he's used numerical signs to a great degree. As long as they weren't caught up, I remember one time I was telling Ted about some of the signs that developed over in Birmingham, Alabama. He said, you've got to give a sermon here tomorrow on that. A few years later, it was a different story. He said, we don't want you to talk anymore about numerics. So I quit talking about them. But I didn't disbelieve them. I didn't discount them. I didn't erase them from my, my mind. Now, Malachi 3 and verse 1, now here's an absolute. You can absolutely sink your absolute teeth. Well, not your absolute teeth. When others have those, do we? But you can absolutely sink what you have as teeth into this and absolutely believe. If you continue to believe in it, it'll be fulfilled. Malachi 3, verse 1, which says, Behold, I will send my messenger. Now, before Jesus Christ returns, he has to send a messenger. Now, unless you believe there are about 60 or 100 years left, he's already sent that messenger. Of course, I know he has. And now that messenger has been prepared for 50-something years and is being sent now around the world to get a message out as a witness and then to lead a team based on this word finally to a place of final training to get put into um, action true religion education within the context of a balanced society and pioneer that over the world tomorrow so Christ can begin to bring about the results of what the message is all about to provide everyone an opportunity of worshiping the true God and loving their neighbor until all of mankind has come into this framework of life so he says behold I will send my messenger he didn't say your messenger he says my mine is the possessive pronoun the messenger belongs to God. And anyone who tampers with that man is violating God's possessive pronoun, his ownership. You better believe God Almighty is able to take care of his own. He says the messenger is his. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Now, that's an absolute. The Scripture cannot be broken. Before Christ comes, he's got to send a messenger and through that messenger, prepare the way for a second coming. And all five verses of Malachi 3 are speaking about the second coming of Christ. All you got to do is read them. I won't take time out now. I know I preached on this in Tucson. A couple of weeks ago, I've been preaching on it for 20-something years. But I went out, and Mr. Armstrong uh, sat down. We began talking. He said, Gerald, you know, uh, Malachi 3, verses 1 through 5, are speaking absolutely about the second coming of Christ. And I smiled and said, yes, sir. That's what I believe, and I've been believing for a long time. It's very plain. You just read all the statements here. They have to do with what Christ does at his second coming. So the messenger is directly referring to the messenger who prepares the way for Christ's second coming. And, and incidentally, or by way of type, applies to John the Baptist who prepared the way for Christ's first coming. But the second coming of Christ is far more significant than the first coming. Now, that's not properly understood by those infected by Satan's religion. 
they put all the emphasis back on Christ's death. That was very important. I'm not taking from that, but I'm adding to what that death made possible. Christ did not die as an end result. He died to make possible his second coming and saving the world and building a great family. And Satan wants us to put a limit on that death by looking at the death only. No, we realize that death makes possible the family of God, and we see this great family result. Now Christ is coming back to save the world. That coming now is much more, you know, positive, much more uh, glorious than the first coming. He came to die the first time. And two, we're not saved by his death. Mr. Armstrong has quoted that many a time. Romans 5 says we're reconciled to God by the death of his son, but we're saved by his life. So the world's going to be saved by a living Christ, not a dead Christ. Now, he died to make possible his second coming to save the world. Now his second coming is a glorious coming and a glorious preparation because now he's preparing to come and save the world and capitalize on what that death made possible. Mr. Armstrong's writing that in his book, A Voice Cries Out, and he shows John the Baptist came in a physical wilderness of Judea, preparing for a physical Christ to come to a material temple, whereas he is preparing uh, in a spiritual wilderness a worldwide religious confusion, not for a physical Christ, but a divine Christ to come not to a physical temple made out of gold and silver and precious stones and wood, but to a spiritual temple made up of spirit being, all of whom can respond and think and carry out the directives of the head of that temple. There's no comparison any more than Christ now compares to what he was as a human being. He is billions of times greater than he was as a human being. The temple to which he's coming is going to be billions of times more valuable than the one, the physical temple, that's made out of inanimate gold and silver and precious stones. And therefore, the preparation is far more profound than the one in a physical wilderness for a physical Christ to come to a physical temple. I think people realize what an office that God has raised up and how much Satan hates it and is trying with every bit of his ingenuity to keep people's minds clouded, to discount the power and the authority and the purpose of that office. So he's causing them, he's robbing them of a chance of becoming members of that team. So a lot of people give themselves over to the great robber. And they say, thank you, you know, for what you told me, which is turned is just eroding their confidence toward the team captain and jeopardizing their future as a team member. Isn't that something? People really thank the one that's robbing them. You don't do that in the human realm, do you? Someone came in and began to rob your home. You say, oh, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Come, people come along and began to rob you of confidence, of faith, of supporting Mr. Armstrong. And then people think that's good. They listen to the rumors listen to the slanderous remarks, and think that's good for them. Mr. Armstrong is going to have some pretty powerful information coming on that pretty soon about why disfellowshipping and why we should not listen to anyone who comes from anyone other than Christ through Mr. Armstrong. And the Bible still, I've preached it everywhere I've gone, because that's what the Bible says. I'm glad he's come out with power on it, because he's got to safeguard God people and give them a real sure warning now that you shouldn't listen to dissonant material. Because that's poison. And when you begin to imbibe poison, you begin to jeopardize your future life. So Christ here said he would send the messenger, and he would prepare the way for his coming. He didn't say he'd prepare part way, he'd prepare all the way. All right, Malachi 4, that messenger would first of all tell the world to remember God's law. Verse 4, Malachi 4, remember you the law of Moses, my servant. I've been hearing Mr. Armstrong for, let's see, uh, about 30-something years. The theme of his message has always been, remember God's law. Remember the Sabbath. Remember the holy days. Remember the laws of marriage, the laws of child rearing, the laws of success, the laws of health, and on and on. But he'd also say that Christ must come and send the law out from Zion, and that will save the world, that will free the world from its problems. So he says this messenger must be telling the world, remember God's law. And he further defines and shows it is the office of Elijah that's being failed to do that. Verse 5, he says, after he says, remember the law of Moses, he says, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. In other words, that's the way I'm going to tell you to remember my law. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Not the person, but one like John the Baptist who is coming in the office with the same spirit and power, preparing the way for Christ's second coming like John prepared the way for Christ's first coming. 
So John the Baptist and Mr. Armstrong will serve with Elijah in his office, and they as a team will turn the whole world away from worshiping the devil to worshiping God, away from worshiping the false Savior to the true Savior, and, un and, and re-educate the human race from a false concept of purposes on this earth to the one true purpose for which mankind was placed on the earth. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the eternal. The day of the Lord follows the tribulation. So he's talking about a man who would be sent prior to the day of the Lord. And the man would, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Because there's no way you can build a worldwide society unless you know the purpose of the family. You have to understand why God made us male and female, why he gave us children, why he ordained the family. That's, that's the basic building block of society. Then you have to know how to put all these families together under God by religious control, then how to relate these families together by educational control so we can share life under God and together as family units, which is the basic building block of society. So he shows that the commission of Elijah would have to understand the basic beginnings, which is why God created us male and female, and how to turn parents to children and children to parents. Of course, you're a lot more involved. It means the whole religious and educational system put these families together under God by religious control and bind them together by educational control. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And the word curse is translated in Zechariah 14, verse 11, the same Hebrew word, utter destruction. Christ said, if I didn't have this messenger that is preparing the way for my second coming, then of course he couldn't come. Because there's a preparation, remember? Unless I had this messenger whom I'm preparing the way for my second coming through, I would otherwise have to intervene and smite the earth with a curse. He's trained no one else could understand this generation. In fact, it's hard for us. Anyone who died 50 years ago could not relate to this world. There's even a generation gap where parents can't understand their children. How much more if someone died 50 years ago, he could not understand this world. So Moses could not relate to this world. Elijah couldn't. He's going to be the chairman. He's going to have a man under him who has the mechanics of education and religion, who does understand this world, who has on his team people who represent the rest of mankind. Mr. Armstrong will have on his team Australians, South Africans, Filipinos, Canadians, Americans, and others. And through that team, he can relate to the rest of mankind. But he's got to bring all these people from these different nations to where they're on his team. So God's going to take him and all those who prove the goal of the way out of their various uh, nations to one place, and we're going to spend three and a half years there until we all become of the same mind. Now, I know those people were different. I've lived in Australia, and I've lived in the Philippines, and I've lived in South Africa, and I've lived in England, and I've traveled all around the world many times, been around it ten times, and back and forth, and many other times, it's equivalent to worldwide trips. And there are different customs, different traditions, different family life, different styles, customs, diets, and etc. So God's going to have to take his people out of all these holding patterns and educate us to the same way. But then we, as Mr. Armstrong's team, will enable him to relate through that team to lead the rest of those on his team that represent the different peoples around the world out of their past orientation to the same way of life. So God, through Elijah, down through Mr. Armstrong, with the mechanics of both religion and education, will establish himself through that team, Christ will through that team establish himself, and lead the rest of mankind out as they're brought to repentance and want to learn the right way then those in that government that understand that particular group of people as their call will extend religion, education out under Mr. Armstrong's supervision, under the overall approval of Elijah, and show those people how to worship God and love neighbor until the whole world has finally been made at one with God to worship him through one system of religion and to love neighbor through one system of educational control. And when I mean education, I don't just mean classroom activity. I mean controlling all TV and radio and every book that's published and, and distributed for, for consumption. The recreation, the entertainment, the social activities, family life, and everything else to be controlled from headquarters out through that team until it's worldwide. And that will show the way of life by which everyone can qualify to become a member of that family if they're but willing. And Christ said without this group he would smite the earth with utter destruction because he would have no one through whom he could relate himself to the peoples that are going to have to be educated of all these different orientations to become one under his supervision to relate back through him to his father. This team is very important to Christ. Back in Matthew 17, verse 11, he's talking about this Elijah to come as he explains what must occur up to his second coming, the preparation. And he says here in Matthew 17, verse 11, he says, Elijah truly shall first come. Now, what was he going to do when he comes? 
and restore all things. I preached on that for about 20-something years, and I wonder, why can't people see the purpose of the term song, the Philadelphia near why we have headquarters, why we have the foundation of all knowledge, why God has raised up a headquarters church and a headquarters educational program through us, let us spread churches worldwide in the educational program of both Ephraim and Manasseh as the preliminary training to get a team that is geared to do the big job in the world of our when we change the spirit, then we're going to spread religion inclusively worldwide for all of mankind and finally spread education into all nations and build one world. I use this scripture as a base because it said when this Elijah comes, he will restore all things. You know, when God designed the office for this time, in other words, when God drew up his master plan, he also drew up a master plan for the government to be established at Christ's second coming. So he designed the office that Abel was trained for, and Enoch was trained for, and Noah was trained for, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Ronald. Now, when he got to the office for this time, he said, now the man that fills this office must be qualified to do this, 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 and this. He drew up a job description for the office, just like any intelligent businessman would do. Then he looks for a person who can fill the job description. How long would you be in office? You, you want to just hire anyone and say, I don't care whether you can do the job or not. I don't have any job description. Do you smile rightly? Are you sincere? No, they say you have to have a job description that determines whether or not you're qualified to fulfill the job. So jo God drew up a job description. He said the man that fills this office must first of all be one through whom we can get our message to the whole world. He must be one through whom we can warn all nations. So he must be a man of strength that will not back down and refuse to go out and stand up strong against the nations. He must be a man that is locked into our government so firmly that when the devil uh, sends all of his uh, forces against him, the man will still obey our government. So we have the first one locked into relationship under our government and based on our word that cannot be moved. The man must be so entrenched in our word that when the devil hits him with all force, the man will not reject the foundation of our coming family. The man must be able to, to survey our word, so he must have a talent for surveying. The Bible is written in a jumbled up manner. You must be led by God to survey through and pick out the various relative scripture and put together which paints the picture. It's just like God painted many overall pictures, one of his overall plan, the doctrinal pictures and so forth, and he sliced them up into many pieces like a puzzle, and then he scrambled all these pieces of the puzzle, and he has to go through and lead someone to select out various pieces throughout the Bible that ha help paint the right picture. So the man has to be a, a very... Uh, 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 capable man to survey. So God gave Mr. Armstrong the talent for surveying. He was the first man to ever conduct a nationwide survey on in the United States. I started to say on the earth, but I guess he would have been because no one's ever surveyed the whole earth. And when you pioneer a program, you have a talent. Mr. Armstrong's the first man to ever conduct a nationwide survey. They said the man, when we reveal then our truth to him, and lead him through the Bible to begin to see our plan, our purpose, and how to bring it about, we must make sure the man can speak it plainly and write it plainly first to our church so we can reveal through him to our church our plan and purpose. And then further, we must use the man to make it plain to the whole world. That's why Mr. Armstrong speaks so plainly. God made sure he could. When you hear Mr. Armstrong, you don't have to strain uh, to feel you're going to get what he's saying. You can just relax. I know when I heard this tape from China, I didn't get a thing that Chinaman was saying. Sounded like Greek to me. Then when Mr. Rader came on, I had to strain to a certain degree. When Mr. Rader came on, I just relaxed. Because the words were coming out so full, so resonant, and put together in such a way that I could relax and knew I would get what he was saying. And then Mr. Armstrong has been given this great gift of writing and of having the urge to always write down what he comes to understand. And ever since Mr. Armstrong first began to study God's Word and came to understand a certain doctrine or concept, he would write it up. He wrote things up back in 1927. He studied out, like, does God exist? The proof of the Bible. He's always had this knack of writing uh, what he has come to understand. God knew the man would have to be one who would write what he's led to understand so God could spread around the world and his people could read what the apostle is saying. So they would all be able to read what the apostle is writing and not have to rely on hearsay through 15 or 20 people across whole vast uh, areas of the earth. I remember when I was in college, Mr. Armstrong used to carry uh, envelopes around his pocket. Every time an idea would come, he'd write it down, and he'd go to his typewriter and write it up as soon as he could. I've visited him in Tucson several times. He's always writing. He says, I've got to get these things down before they leave my mind. 
Because when he gets the concept, he wants to write it down while it's crystal clear in his mind. God made sure the man had that orientation so he'd have a man that could speak plainly and then write plainly. He could get a message out to his church worldwide and then to the whole world. Because he'll be the main one writing in the world of art. He's getting a head start writing books already to make it plain, clear, understandable. And I think God even gave him a straight back. When I first met Mr. Armstrong, I was always athletically inclined. I grew up in athletes, athletics, athletes. Well, among athletes and athletics. And how to serve Mr. Armstrong the first time, I said, that's the straightest back I've ever seen a, a human being have. I used to not understand why. But I think God ordered a straight back. Knowing the man would type more when he's 87, 88, 90, 91, 92 than any man who ever lived. And he said, he needs a straight back. So the center of gravity is straight down, not forward or backward. Because if you've got a little hump back, then gravity pulls your shoulders and arms forward. And you get tired very quickly now. When I've been before type for about an hour and a half or so, I get very tired. My arms and shoulders begin to feel very heavy. But Mr. Armstrong's got this straight back, so the center of gravity pulls the arms and shoulders straight down through the spine, and therefore it's not pulling forward or backward. He can sit there 8, 10, 12, and 14 hours a day, which he does quite often, and types. And most of you could not even sit before a type like that. You'd be so tired. And pretty soon you'd be like me. You'd be over you know, if you were trying to type, and you'd be typing this way. You'd be bowed under the table. So, uh, you see, uh, all God has to do is, is determine then what must be to fill the office, and he designs by DNA and makes sure he brings the man on the scene. That's easy to understand. Remember the prophecy back in, uh, in the Old Testament of Rebekah? The prophecy was she had two nations in her womb. God was forming Jacob and Esau to promote two nations, and God chose Jacob over Esau because he was promoting the two national groups through those little uh, fetuses. And he chose Jacob over Esau because he knew what he was investing in the two lads. Remember John the Baptist who was preparing, raised up to prepare the way for Christ's second coming, I mean first coming? When Elizabeth was pregnant with John by about six months, just a little over. And Mary, who was just pregnant with Jesus, came to Elizabeth's home and walked in the door. John leaped in the womb of Elizabeth. Now, that was done by God's Spirit. That was not done by John. There said, turn to the light bright on, Mom. I'm, I'm doing my Bible study. I think it's about time to jump. He was a six-month fetus. God moved the lad by his Spirit to show this is the one I am grooming to prepare the way for my son. So when Jesus came into his presence, just barely uh, a forming little fetus in the womb of Mary, John was already being formed because he was to come on the scene, advance and prepare for Christ. So he leaped in the womb of Elizabeth. Now, John prepared the way for Christ's first coming. How much more do you think the Spirit of God was involved in grooming Mr. Armstrong, who is preparing the way for Christ's second coming, which is a far more profound uh, preparation than the first coming. This is a worldwide preparation to get everything ready for Christ to come and begin to re-educate the world. So when they drew up the master plan, and within that master plan, the office down drew up the job description, then they drew up the DNA and said, we'll promote a man based on this formula that can do the job. So they intervened and made sure the man had the right name, the right orientation, the right background and all. So when he came on the scene, he'd have the background preparation so they could have a man that could fill the office and lead this Philadelphia era over into the world of art and do the job. This is a profoundly significant office. That's why the devil hates it so much. So it says over here, as we've read in Matthew 17, verse 11, when that man comes, he would restore all things. Only one man could be in that position. He has to be the first one locked into God's government, the first one locked into the foundation of all knowledge, the one that gets the message out to the world, the one that has the team under him to, to fulfill what the message is all about, to re-educate the world so they can love God and love neighbor. So God conquered Mr. Armstrong in 1927. Then after seven years of his living in that conquered state, then he raised up through Mr. Armstrong the Philadelphia era to provide a means by which God could conquer a team to serve under the apostles, to be his team in this great work in the world tomorrow. The next ones are going to be conquered by the Laodiceans who go into the tribulation and finally uh, uh, declare that they believe what Christ is doing through the man and through the Philadelphia era. Then the Josephites and Israelites of the world tomorrow to come up before us and declare they finally understand them, the Gentiles through the Israelites. So what God started through Mr. Armstrong is the beginning of a program by which he's going to bring everyone to be locked into his government, to submit to his rule. Mr. Armstrong's the first one locked into that 
in a mechanical process geared for the world tomorrow. The first one locked into the foundation of all knowledge, the Word of God. And then the man to have a team under him that would be locked into God's government and predicated on the Word of God under his supervision, and then others must come into that program that's initiated through them until God has finally conquered all of mankind and brought them into his family and comes down to a conquered family so he can take over and lead a conquered family forever. So he started through the man. That's the only way you can understand a man who can restore all things. He's the first one of a process that will finally involve everyone else in a system that relates them to God and to one another and to neighbor. So he said there in Matthew 17, when that Elijah comes preparing for Christ's second coming, he would restore all things. And that's something Satan hates with a purple passion. Now, the book of Revelation, some of you may have heard me down Emerald, I may have gone through this, but the book of Revelation absolutely proves that Mr. Armstrong is the man that is fulfilling that office of Elijah, the one that capsules the prophecy of Zerubbabel, the, the type of Moses, the messenger, the Elijah to come, etc. And it's all capsule in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is a message for God's church. That's why the book was written, to show God's church what a fantastic responsibility this era of God's church has is to understand the book of Revelation and have the responsibility of building based on the Word of God and getting all the messages in the Bible out to the nations when they become relevant. Mr. Armstrong is tight by all these different ones because he's going to take their messages to the nations when the messages of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and all become relevant to different nations. He'll be the one that begins to tell those nations and continue to tell those nations until they're finally conquered and a part of God's program of the world tomorrow. And he'll give them religion education so they become an integral part of God's way of life. Revelation 1, verse 1, keys in the purpose of the book of Revelation. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, for what purpose? To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. In other words, to show unto his servants at a time when things come on the scene to confirm what he has revealed to them. To reveal to his servants things which must shortly come to pass, then they proclaim to the world, then Christ backs it up by intervening and proving what was said was true. The time frame, Revelation 1, verse 10, was, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So John was projected forward by way of vision, 1900 years, and he stood in this, in this uh, visionary scene at the time of the day of the Lord, and he saw this whole book of Revelation unfold before him to show that the messenger who came 1900 years ago with a divine message from his father and delivered that to his church to be delivered to the world at this time because the message, the gospel, that's why a lot of people can't understand why it wasn't preached for 18 and a half centuries. Because the gospel is relevant to this day and time. It's relevant when nations could be told, here's what God's about to do. Christ intervenes and they come to see it. The gospel is relevant to the nations who live out of this world into the world tomorrow. So Christ came and delivered that message 1,900 years ago. Then he kept it in his church until he was ready to deliver it. John saw how that would be possible and what era would do the job. So he saw the church of God would go through seven stages. In other words, it wasn't a general statement, so you could say, well, God intended the gospel to go out back here over there. Seven eras to show God would have seven stages to his church to enable him to train seven different groupings of people from seven different categories of, of, of responsibility in the government of God, but also to make it very plain that God purposed that a certain era would have the responsibility of getting the message to the world. So John saw the Philadelphia era. Named properly, Philadelphia means brotherly love. God is love, so he's getting a team ready to learn that way of love in a place of final training, so he, through this team, can carry it over in the world tomorrow and teach it consistently until it's worldwide. And he has one worldwide consistent society in which everyone worships God in the same way and everyone loves neighbor in the same way so he can build in that framework a unified family that speaks the same thing, responds the same way, loves the same father in the same way, and loves neighbor in the same way, and shares in the same common way of life. So first of all, the Philadelphia near has the right name. Next verse, verse 8 says the Philadelphia era would have the door open before it that no one could shut. Why did he get the message out? Christ brought a message 1,900 years ago and delivered it to the church, but the church could not take it to the world until the door was open. be like our receiving a message here. And we're told it must go to the mayor of Amarillo. And, and all the doors are locked. Well, we'll just say there's one door. 
then you look at the door. Don't try to go through the wall. That, uh, that uh, produces flat-faced people. But don't try to go through the door as long as it's locked. Wait until the door opens, then you take the message out. So Christ delivered a message to his church and said, Take the world. But they couldn't do it until the door was open. So he comes to the sixth year and he says, Now I place before you an open door, and no one can shut it. And he says, You have kept my word, and you have not denied my name. That's the scripture I used all the time to refute anyone that said Mr. Armstrong was open to God's word because it said the Philadelphia area has kept his word and not denied his name. They've obeyed him, and they have built their program on his word. And it applies more to the leader than the era because the era of the team is built through the leader. So it says the Philadelphia area has the door open before it that no one can shut. It has kept his word and not denied his name because the, the Elijah to come is to restore all things. It has to be based on the God's word. It has to be under God's governmental supervision. So he said the Philadelphia era then would be the one that had the open door, the right name, and would keep his word and not deny his name. Then as a result of the message going out, verse 9 says, the nations that hear it have to come up before us in the world tomorrow. They bow down and worship before our feet. That's how we become divine beings and acknowledge God loved us. So in three verses, he makes it very plain that the church with the right name, Philadelphia, that's to learn the way of God's love first to tell the world, would have the door open to get the message of God's plan out to the world, and the plan would be predicated on the Word of God and under God's uh, overall rule. That's why this church here has been committed for keeping God's Word and not denying His name. And then, as a result of the message going out and our being capable of finding re-educating the Word, is going to make people to come up to claim they were Christians, come up before us, bow down and say, Now we know God loved you. Would you please teach us? how we, in turn, love God and love neighbor. So in that context, let's read Revelation 10 and verse 7. You can establish very easily there that the leader of the Philadelphian era, and the Philadelphian era are the, the, is, is the instrumentality through which Christ is preparing the way for a second coming, getting the message out, and preparing a group to re-educate the world. So in Revelation 10, verse 7, he says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, that's at Christ's second coming. The mystery of God should be finished, as he has declared to his servants the prophets. That says a whole powerful mouthful. Why would God's message be a mystery to the world up to Christ's second coming? And why does his second coming resolve the mystery? And notice when it's resolved, it's going to be resolved exactly as Christ has already declared it to his servants the prophets. He's got to reveal to Mr. Armstrong exactly what he wants him to say. Wouldn't that be something Christ intervened and said, Well, I tried. I came close to what I said I was going to do. I just missed the mark a short way. But why should I expect to be perfect? I'm just God. Now, I hope all of you people out there around the world will not let this discourage you, because if I missed my, the mark this far in my countdown, and when I try to bring all you nations together, I might not even have a place open for you Chinese, because I may be so far off base that you won't even have a place. So I hope you'll hope against hope, pray and fast and study, and just hope your God can do better as he begins from Jerusalem that he did from heaven. His countdown in heaven was so off that he didn't quite do it the way he told to his servant, so uh, you can't rely on me. So I may even go back to heaven and quit the whole program. <laughs> See, he's got to do it the way he says, to prove he's God. And so work not built by human effort or power, but by the Spirit of God. That's why he has a man who's already been dead once. is old. He has to rely upon God's help. He could never do the job of himself. And he's given, Mr. Armstrong's given a team that God says has but little strength, so we can't trust in ourselves. So God's going to make sure we come to realize it's not done by human power and a human might, but by the Spirit of God. That's why everyone in the Philadelphia area must come to trust in the Spirit of God leading the apostle and not look on these things carnally. Because if you're carnal-minded, you can't please God. You've got to believe that God's power is big enough and powerful enough to lead his apostle and do what he wants to do, because he says here, by the time Christ comes to to solve the mystery, it's going to be done as he has revealed through his servants the prophets. Now, why is it going to be a mystery, first of all? Well, it won't not be long, it may be shorter than some of you think, until the Pope moves to Jerusalem. Not to move the Vatican, but begins to go to Jerusalem to make overtures to the world about what he is going to be declaring God, that he's going to claim the devil is, is about to do. So when he goes to Jerusalem, he's going to begin to... to uh, Make overtures to the world and say God is intervening through him, the Pope, and the Catholic Church to bring peace to the world. And he has chosen the sector of Europe to begin in. 
Now, that would be all right, you see. They'd have real advantage, except God's not going to let them get by with that. So he's going to move Mr. Armstrong down there right by the Pope. You know what he's going to tell him? He's not going to say, well, you, you're probably sincere. You must be a holy man because everyone around the world thinks you are. And since you believe in holy water, maybe we ought to believe in holy water. If that pigeon dung makes it holy, maybe we better buy some pigeons. Maybe we ought to believe in, in incense and rosaries and all that, too. You no, know, he's going to go down there and say, you are false. He's going to say, you don't know the true God. I do. The Catholic Church is not the true church. The one I have is. And you don't know the plan of God, I do. And boy, that's going to stir up a harness nest, I'll guarantee you. The Bible says we're going to be hated of all nations. When Mr. Armstrong is moved to account of the Pope down there, I'll guarantee you anyone that's in line with him is not going to be like many nations because the world's going to relate to the Pope and the Catholic Church and think traditional religion is right. So as Mr. Armstrong is moved down there by Jesus Christ, then he will have a program already ready to move God's people down. Now, I get rid of the, uh, I'm sure that God will... We're going to fly, there's no doubt about that. The Bible clearly says that in Revelation 12. And you want to fly one way in airplanes. You don't spout wings. You don't get so hold of the wings crop through. None of you have felt wings budging through yet, have you? Well, you better get a hold of it right quick if you expect to spout wings. We're going to fly in airplanes. Now, how do you think we might buy or, or secure them? Well, I'm sure Mr. Armstrong just appoint Mr. Raider, who's already had experience, who in turn would buy a, a, a fleet of planes or lease them, whichever way he might go down and resell them to arrows, make a profit. Or whatever, we might find some good DC 10s or own special. Now that will get rid of all the rest who can't trust Christ. Well, most of them. And then Mr. Armstrong will have to draw up an overall master plan to send planes all around the world to pick people up in all the airports in the 45 days between the 1335 and the 1290. And it says anyone who comes to 1335 days is blessed. God knows if you come that far, you'll go all the way. If you don't come that far, something else is still uh, causing you to distrust Jesus Christ. So then, as Mr. Armstrong goes down there, he, he sets in motion this plan that begins to uh, shuttle people all around the world down to Jerusalem. So people are flying in. They're getting off, going down to an area called Tekoa and assembling, mustering there. And then European strategists who have this plan in motion, using the Pope, see, they won't see God in the picture of the devil. They'll, it'll just be a plan where the Europeans are going to take over the world. And they're seeing a way to use the Pope to their advantage, the Catholic Church. So they're in full support of the, uh, of the, of the Pope and the Catholic Church to unite Europe. So as they see their henchmen down there in, in Jerusalem beginning to make overtures to the world, they see Mr. Armstrong come on the scene. They think he's just interfering with their plan. They won't see God in the picture. They'll say, what's this man up to? This man has already been going around and reaching world leaders and programming them that the only hope of the world is world government. So now we can see he's been setting himself up. He's also been telling them that the only hope of the world is that a strong hand from some place intervenes. Now we can see that man is Armstrong. And that he, he was referring to the strong hand at the end of his strong arm. Now we're beginning to see he's got a tremendous hypnotic power of people because he's got people all around the world flying down to join him. See, there'll be European intelligence will be monitoring all these flights going down to Jerusalem. They say, what? This man is dangerous. And the more of these planes they see flying, they say, this man is becoming more dangerous. He's got some of our German people going down. He's really got a hypnotic spell. Further, the man already has Jews and Arabs looking to him. That's unique. If he gets these Jews and Arabs to all support him, then he could take over the Middle East oil to them and have a leverage to force other nations to bow down before him. And he could say, I'm already represented by all nations because I have people all around the world flying in to join me. So I'm the logical world ruler. See, that's the way they'll interpret it. So they will think the man is there to uh, interfere and preempt the Pope and take over world rule having represented him all around the world to back him up and therefore make himself world ruler. You know what they're going to do? They're going to send an army down. So they send an army down under the pretense of peace, peacekeeping forces, but only those that are with Mr. Armstrong down in Tekoa as he's working, witness against the Pope in Jerusalem, will know better. Because the Bible plainly tells us when you see Jerusalem encompassed with armies, flee! And when the trumpet is blown in Tekoa and this ill wind is blowing in the north, you better flee. So God has to make sure all those who go down there and know that their purpose end up in a place of final training. When the armies come, that's the signal to go on. And they'll be those who go all the way because they've already left their homes, backgrounds, countries, according to the apostles' direction, and flown down to a place of, to the Middle East, and then from there they'll be shuttled on down to, uh, to Petra. You know, it says, flee from Judea to the mountains. We've got to get to Judea first. Then we'll flee from there to the mountains. 
the area patron. Now, that sets up a, a witness, counter witness. See, the Pope, the devil through the Pope will be proclaiming he's God. Then, then God, by way of Christ of his turn, will be saying, no, you're not, I'm God. And that sets up a witness, counter witness, just like in the days of Egypt, when the devil through the, through the Pharaoh was trying to claim he was God. God through Moses was saying, no, you're not, I am. And this contest went on for some time. God let the devil duplicate the miracles until the final uh, plague, which proved God was supreme. Remember, the death of the firstborn. So God's going to set this system up through Mr. Armstrong to counter the devil's message through the Pope. And this thing will continue for three and a half years. Now, in order for God to put his message on the map with power and substance, he has another era designed to come. Of those who will not recognize the power and the authority of Christ to Mr. Armstrong until it's too late to go with him. And that's your choice. It's not that you can't. It's so some people are going to use carnal reasoning and refuse to see the power and the authority behind this church. And when they see Mr. Armstrong and the Philadelphia are gone, they can't argue anymore that he's old and senile in Tucson. They can't argue anymore that Mr. Rader runs the church. They can't argue anymore against errors of the church. They can't argue against the place of safety. They can't argue with the United States of Europe it's coming. Then they're going to know they've been wrong. They have not been subject to the authority of God Almighty. Then they're going to realize the tribulation is imminent. Then they're going to repent. Hopefully most of them will. They're going to quit arguing and they're going to begin to pray. They're going to realize prayer produces a lot more than arguing and fault finding. And they're going to have to get close enough to God. By that time, the tribulation to go into the tribulation and, and t testify against the devil system in Europe. And I'll tell you, that's going to take great faith and confidence. They're going to stand up and say, we don't believe in this system in Europe. We believe this system is of Satan, the devil. The Pope serves the devil. The beast serves the devil. This whole Catholic Church and European system is of the devil. Now, we believe, on the other hand, that the true God and the true Christ have a, a messenger down in Jerusalem who is Herbert Armstrong. And they're revealing their message through him. And he has a group of people under him called Philadelphians who believe the Word of God is the foundation of knowledge. And they're preparing to give the world true religion, education, and peace will come about through that system and not through this wretched system in Europe which they're claiming. And then they're going to try to intimidate them with the guillotine. And those people must go all the way to the guillotine and lay their heads on the chopping block. That's as far as you can go to testify that you believe in something. And when all these people of the Laodicean orientation end up in Europe's sprinkle world, they'll never do a group work on die as individuals. But they die on the guillotine. That's going to affect all the onlookers emotionally. They're going to say, what in the world is this man saying? And who are these people down in Petra if so many are dying to, in support of what they're doing? And that divides Satan's stranglehold over the Europeans. So he has to try to regroup. So he uses his modern Janice and Jambres the Pope and the beast against his modern Moses and Aaron, the two witnesses, to try to regroup himself, to try to establish himself as supreme. And that contest will go on for three and a half years, the remainder of three and a half years, until God finally brings it to a head. Now, he's not going to bring it to a head like the average person would think. Just three and a half days before Christ comes, he's going to allow the beast to rise up and kill Mr. Armstrong and his assistant. And their bodies are going to lie in the street of Jerusalem. And the Pope's going to take this satellite system he's been using to proclaim he's God around the world. And, of course, when Mr. Armstrong is dead, his assistant's dead, the Pope's going to zero in on that and say, this man is dead. That proves he couldn't be right. I'm alive. That proves I'm right. And not only am I right, I am God. That's when he will stand in whatever's built in the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and proclaim himself as God. He could never do that as long as Mr. Armstrong's there to refute it. When Mr. Armstrong's dead, that's going to give him the... Uh, the opportunity to claim he's God. That's when the devil really moves with force to claim he's God. And that'll go on for three and a half days. And as people view these two bodies around the world, they're going to rejoice. They're going to exchange gifts. They're going to say, these two tormentors that tormented us day and night are now dead. Then three and a half days later, God revives the two men. And all these half-asleep people, their eyes begin to bulge out. Angels catch them, so you still got something to see, this double feature. And they see these two men rise up. And uh, they go up to the clouds with Christ. All the rest of the first fruits are resurrected. We have the marriage supper with Christ. He explains the organized structure. All of those are in, in uh, the department heads and divisional heads. So everyone understands his organized structure and government. So we come down as an organized governmental team so there's no confusion. So everyone knows who's responsible in what area of control. Job in building. Noah in the racial control. Moses in the ruling arm. Uh, Joseph in the economic arm. Elijah 
and those working in his office for the social arm of the family of the government of God. Then we come down as an ordered team. On the way down, Christ binds the devil, gets him out of the way. He destroys the Babylonian system with the seven last plagues, gets out of the way. Then he destroys those armies gathered around Jerusalem and gets those out of the way. The only two of the opposition still standing will be the beast and the false prophet. And he's going to come to the Mount of Olives. He's going to take those two imposters that have been claiming their God. He's going to take one by the nap of the neck, the other by, with the other hand by the nap of the neck, and before world television, say, I'm going to prove these two were not God. Say, I'm the true Jesus Christ. My Father owns the universe. My Father put the human race on here to become his family, just as I have been revealing through my servant Herbert Armstrong. It's going to be done that way, because it's been my Father's message that I, as a divine messenger, have been faithfully getting out through my faithful human messenger. And it's going to be done precisely that way. And I'm going to prove to you these two impostors are false. I'm going to burn them up. So I'm going to take both of them up to the Valley of Hinnom, toss them over the Hinnom fire, reignite that, and burn those two bodies up before the world audience to prove they're not God. The best way to prove someone is not God is burn him up. That's a surefire proof. It works every time. And from that time forward, there'll be no more mystery. The world will then know what the true message is, who the true Christ, who the true God, and who the true servants of God are, and what the plan of God is that Mr. Armstrong would have been proclaiming to the world powerfully for those three and a half years. That will clear up the mystery. That's what it's talking about here. The mystery of God shall be finished the day Christ comes. Verse 11 says, Revelation 10, verse 11. Now, leading up this final climax, he says, you must prophesy again. You can't prophesy again unless you've already prophesied once. You know why we really believe the work would end in 1972 so we could be told to do it again? If we thought the work would just keep going to the end, we never had a, a period when we thought it in, we couldn't be told to do it again. We could only be told keep doing it, right? That's why God made sure we thought, <coughs> thought and I could prove the work went in in 72. And I could do it until God proved I couldn't. But up until then, no one could prove that I couldn't. Because we had, God made sure we could put things together in such a way that we were really convinced. So we could really understand then, and therefore later understand this prophecy, we had to do it twice so the leader could be identified as the man who had reached the world twice. So up to 72, it shows he should have been reaching world leaders. It said, you must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. But you must do it two times. You can't do something again unless you've already done it once. Get the point? To show that after 72, Mr. Armstrong then would have to go out and do again what he thought he had finished before. Now, so that God wanted this so the people of the Philadelphia era could see in some very specific proofs who the leader of this work is, the power and the authority behind the office. So God can hold those who will not accept the proof accountable. And when they go in the tribulation, there's going to be no argument. Most of them will have heard me many times. will have heard Mr. Armstrong make definite statements. And when they get in the tribulation, Christ is going to say, Now, all you had were excuses. And they won't argue. They'll say, That's right. Now, we repent. Now, while he's reaching the world the second time, let's read on in, in uh, chapter 11. And he says, There was given me a reed like unto a rod. I'm going to have to cut this a little shorter, so it means here, pick up the Bible and use it with authority. The, the reed, it comes from the papyrus, Greek papyrus, which means the Bible. A rod typifies authority. So he's telling Mr. Armstrong, while you're reaching the world the second time, I want you to pick up my word and use it with authority. And you can rest assured, he's just used that authority many times, even with some ministers here recently. He's used that authority. There's a, there's a purpose being worked out now to, to clean up the church, to see who is and who's not on the team. So he says, I want you to rise. The rise would have meant nothing unless Mr. Armstrong died. God knew he could never get Mr. Armstrong to make the move with power to remove his son, to remove all disloyal ministers and disloyal people, unless he put that across so emphatically by letting the man die and then reviving him from the dead to impress upon his mind, I raised you for a purpose. Now you get out and do it. Remember when Mr. Armstrong was revived, he began to write all of us letters. And he said, God raised me for a purpose. God showed me that I'm to put this church, this college, and this foundation back on the right track. God showed me I'm to lead you people into the kingdom of God and present you without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. 
God showed me I'm not to get my mind on some physical temple down in Jerusalem, but on the church of the living God, which is God's temple, and that's what we must be concerned with. And God showed me I'm not to be another Eli. You know what that meant? Deal with your son, because Eli refused to deal with his sons. So he says, I want you to rise and measure the temple of God. The temple of God is God's church and the altar, typifying the ministry and the people that worship therein. Now, you measure for a purpose. Now, once he began to measure, he measured Ted out. He, me he measured, uh, well, he measured most of the liberals out immediately because when he put everything back on the right track, that left the liberals over in their liberal stance. But that didn't get rid of everyone. That's why God made sure Mr. Armstrong had pet ferrets in Tucson to typify what he had to do to him. A little ferret's a real tenacious little creature. But when he gets his teeth in something, he hangs on. That's why the old adage is, you ferret it out, typify it, you know, named after this little creature that's a ferret. Now, you don't know people, probably you probably know no one that has pet ferrets. You've heard people who have pet ferret, uh, parrots, canaries, lovebirds, parakeets, but not pet ferrets. Now, why would his apostle have pet ferrets? To typify God through this man would ferret out the problems as he measured the church. And then God threw him would do it because he'd let him look like he's going to die and more heads would stick up. They said, boy, he's going to go out this time. So they get bold. He lobs a few more off. Then he raised Mr. Arms up and they hide out for a little while. Then he lets him take a nose dive. Well, maybe he will this time. Oh, yeah, I'm sure he will. So they raise their heads up and God ferrets more out, gets rid of them. So through leading Mr. Armstrong the way he does, he tests the faith of people to see whether or not they really believe he means what he says. See, I've often said, I don't look to Mr. Armstrong and say, how is he today? Oh, he's a little down up. I won't preach today. Oh, he's looking better. I think I can preach today. I'll have the boldness. I preach regardless of the way he looks because that has nothing to do with the Scriptures. The Scriptures say what God will do for him regardless of the way he looks. When he was on his deathbed, I was still preaching all over the southeast. God would raise him up and use him more powerfully to the very second coming of Christ. I wasn't preaching by, by sight. I was preaching by what the Word of God says with faith because the Scripture cannot be broken. I heard some ministers down there in the southeast said, Waterhouse out on a limb. No, I was around the trunk of the tree hanging on with, with fervor. They were out on the limb sawing on the wrong side. That's why they dropped the drink when they got through sawing. So he said, I want you to rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Now, those that you measure out are no longer on your team. I've got to make sure that the team I put together in you is so supportive of you, is so loyal, and is so dead set to go with you all the way that I can have no reservation or question whatsoever in their support of you and their orientation as they relate to the program I have going through you. So I can be sure of a team that will teach the same thing. But the court which is without the temple leave out. In other words, those measured out like spiritual Gentiles. See, the physical temple was a type. The physical temple in Jerusalem had an inner court for the Israelites who were God's people because they had representation through the priesthood and the high priest. The outer court was the Gentiles. They were not God's people because they didn't have representation. Now, when God measures through the apostle and the ministry, and people will not go along, they become like spiritual Gentiles tight by the outer court. You know why they're spiritual Gentiles? Because they're no longer God's people. Why? Because they have rejected representation. So when God began to measure through Mr. Armstrong, those that followed him remained God's people because they were represented to God by his apostle, and God had representation uh, to the people. Those that refused then were typified by the outer court, had rejected representation, therefore they were no longer God's people. So in the measuring, it was to test who will go all the way with you and who will not. Who will be my, peop my people and who will not? The ones that are of those who follow my leadership through my appointed ones. Those that are not, those who reject my ministry, and my apostles are no longer my people because they have rejected representation. Therefore, they were typed by the outer court. And he says, okay, of them, measure them not. In other words, they've already rejected you, so you can't deal with them. For they are given unto the Gentiles. You know what God is saying here? He says, since they're acting like Gentiles by rejecting representation, therefore they're like the Gentiles who have no representation, therefore I have no way of dealing with them that I'm going to send them into the European sector, into the Great Tribulation, and put them under Gentiles. And I'm going to teach them they shouldn't act like Gentiles if they don't want to be like Gentiles. So when I send them into the Tribulation, I'm going to convince them right quickly they don't want to be like Gentiles, therefore quit acting like Gentiles. 
by rejecting my rule over you. Now, the only way they can correct that is to prove to God to go into the tribulation, we never again want to act like Gentiles. Therefore, we will never again reject your authority over us. Now, to prove we've learned our lesson, we're going to testify against this Gentile system under the devil in Europe, and we're going to testify to what your son Jesus Christ is doing to Mr. Armstrong in the Philadelphia era to prove we want to be once again like spiritual Israelites, those that are subject to your rule and your leadership, and thereby prove we want to be under your government forever. And if they go all the way, they'll be brought into Christ's government and will have proved they'll never again act like Gentiles by rejecting Christ's authority through his constituted appointed servants. So that's where we are right now. Christ is measuring the church through his apostle. Now, after that, he's given three and a half years. Uh, in, in the final three and a half years, that'll be the fourth point, the fourth proof point says the church, the holy city is going to be tread under foot forward in too much. In other words, the measuring has to be completed before the last three and a half years because then it's going to get so bad because the United States, Canada, Britain, Australia are going into captivity. So God has to have the measuring complete so he can take those who will go all the way with the apostle there to be in a place of final training three and a half years. Those that haven't proved their goal then go into the tribulation. And they must prove to the point of death in the tribulation they are sorry for rejecting God's government and they want to prove by death on the guillotine that they'll never make that mistake again. And then God shows in the latter part, you can read verse, uh, chapter 11, about the power he's going to give the two witnesses to prove it's by his spirit, not by human power and might or dollars or pounds or whatever, that he's going to finish this work. He's going to give Mr. Armstrong such power that money couldn't buy what God's going to give him. And finally, God's people are going to realize it's indeed a work and a power done by God and not done by human efforts. Our efforts are only necessary, but they don't do the work. It's the work of God through his spirit. Now, God wants a people that prove loyal to the team captain. So it says over here in Revelation 3, verse 11, to the Philadelphia era, and I'll tell you, brethren, some of you may not be doing this. And I'll tell you, it's as serious as anything. If some of you end up in the tribulation, you're going to know that God Almighty said his servant to you. And I'll tell you, it's about time to wake up. If you think there's no power and authority behind me, you'll know better when you get in the tribulation. And you won't argue. So the best thing to do now is quit arguing and submit to God Almighty through his apostle. Now God says to Philadelphians over here in verse 11, Behold, I come quickly. You'd better hold fast to what you have, that no man take your crown. I began to preach that in 1974 in all those churches. In fact, I said, God tells all Philadelphians to hold fast to what you have because there are several rebellions that are going to come along, and this is one of them. And they come along and say, turn loose of Pasadena, turn loose of God's apostle, turn loose of errors of the church, turn loose of place of safety, turn loose of the gospel commission. And every one of them does that. They all get caught up and try to lead people away from Mr. Armstrong, away from Pasadena, away from believing in errors of the church, away from believing in a place of safety, away from believing that Mr. Armstrong is preaching the gospel. That's why he has to caution Philadelphians, you'd better take heed and hold fast to what you have. And then only the overcomers are going to be on his team. Those that overcome all the onslaughts of the devil to try to get you to rebel against God's government coming through Mr. Armstrong are just the track of God's word as God reveals that through Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong has written several articles on the fact that Christ puts doctrine of the church through him, through the apostle. Then we must all concur so we can speak the same thing. That's not up the individual interpretation. Then it's a matter, do you trust Christ to be big enough to handle his job or not? Now those that qualify will go with Mr. Armstrong to final training and be prepared to re-educate the world. And those who are not, you know what they have to acknowledge? Revelation 3, verse 14. Here's the message to the Laodicean era that's yet to come, that comes on the scene after we leave. These things saith the Amen. Now, you know what Amen means. Amen means so be it. I agree with what's already been said. The first thing they have to acknowledge is that Christ meant what he said through the apostle. That's the whole question. Those who believe Christ is speaking through the apostle and those who don't. Those who do follow him all the way and those who don't learn the lesson the hard way when they have to acknowledge Christ is the amen and that he's the faithful and true witness. That what he's been witnessing through Mr. Armstrong has been faithful and true in spite of all the twisters and liars that come along to twist and try to make it look like he's not saying what Christ would have him say. They deny that Christ has the power to say, yes, he will. 
God made a jackass speak what he wanted to one time. It's a lot easier to make a servant who has dedicated the work for 50-something years who wants to say to inspire him to say, would you think? Jackass doesn't even know anything about that. But God, Christ spoke to a jackass back in Balaam's time, remember? Thus saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, and the beginner of the creation of God. Notice those three areas that Laodiceans have to come to see. They have to agree that Christ meant what he said to Mr. Armstrong. He was faithful and true in so saying it, and he was establishing the beginning, the beginning of the creation of God through Mr. Armstrong by locking him into his government, locking him into his word, building a team under him through which he begins to re-educate the world and the world tomorrow, and through 1,100 years brings billions into that society to finally complete creation that he will yield up to his Father. You have to begin something before you complete it. What Christ is setting in motion now is the beginning of the creation based on this word under God's government through an apostle and a team that has proved they'll be loyal to him and used the Bible as a foundation for worshiping God and loving neighbor. And then Christ through them pioneers a way over to extend it out to all of mankind and down through the millennium, the great white throne judgment period until everyone has had the chance of becoming a member of that creation. And when they see that, they'll see something worth dying for. When they finally see this, they'll see something worth dying for, and then they'll lay their heads on the chopping block. There'll be no way of arguing. Then they'll realize that Christ was behind Mr. Armstrong, therefore they can die supporting him, that he is faithful and true, they can support what he said, that he has begun to Mr. Armstrong the mechanics to re-educate the world, therefore they can testify to what's going on down in Petra. Okay, in Revelation 20 and verse 4, it shows how the lay of the sins will die. Revelation 20, verse 4, the last two-thirds of the verse, he says, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded. He doesn't say be toed or be elbowed. The problem is not in growing toenails. It's not uh, dirty elbows. It's intellectual vanity that reasons around government. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. Now, they go into the tribulation. Instead of bowing down to testify to what the devil's doing through the Pope and the beast, they refuse to go along with that and say, we believe the true Jesus Christ is testifying to Mr. Armstrong to the world tomorrow, and he is working via him through the Philadelphia era based on the word of God to bring about a program to re-educate the world. And they will then testify against what the devil is doing through the Pope, the beast, and the United States of Europe, and testify to what Christ is doing to Mr. Armstrong in the Philadelphia era. And they have to do that in preference to and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image a Catholic church. Neither had received his mark upon their forge or in their hands. You see, they have to know the true as opposed to the false. They have to support the true to the point of death and in opposition to the false. And God, through the, Phil- the Laodicean era, is going to use them to put the Philadelphia era and what Christ is doing through it on the map. And in letting them go that far, that is, they have to go that far to learn the lesson, then they will qualify to go into government, not ever disagreeing against the way Christ is running his work. And being in full support of the way Christ is going to re-educate the world through Mr. Armstrong in the Philadelphia era. And they have to do that in preference to and which had not worshipped the beast. Neither his image, the Catholic Church. Neither had received his mark upon their forge or in their hands. You see, they have to know the true as opposed to the false. They have to support the true to the point of death and in opposition to the false. And God, through the, Phil- the Laodicean era, is going to use them to put the Philadelphia era and what Christ is doing through it on the map, and in letting them go that far, that is, they have to go that far to learn the lesson, then they will qualify to go into government, not ever disagreeing against the way Christ is running his work, and being in full support of the way Christ is going to re-educate the world through Mr. Armstrong in the Philadelphia era. And it says, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. That's a beautiful end result. You'd better be mighty thankful God has a way of waking all those up who cannot learn the lesson otherwise. Or you don't have any love for those that are going out. I love them, but I won't follow their rebellion. But I'm glad God can wake them up. I know I can't. But God has the power to make them see what they must do to get right with him again to make it. And then they'll, they won't lose out on eternity, even though they go through some terrible suffering. Otherwise, they're gone. There's no way God can convince those who have left they're wrong, except by taking away all their excuses and forcing them by circumstances to admit they've been wrong. Then they've got to make a decision. Now, in closing, God gives an example back through Moses, very critical of our time now. One time, the Israelites, which, are typi- which typified spiritual Israel today, the church, were faced with an enemy. And Moses sent, sent uh, uh, Joshua down to, uh, to, uh, to fight Amalek, remember? 
Moses went to the top of the mount and raised up his hands and asked God for the victory. God began to give the victory, but Moses' hands got tired, and God began to withdraw the victory because he wanted Moses' assistants to come into play. So Aaron and Hur went to the top of the mountain to hold Moses' hands up, and then God resumed the victory. But, but Aaron and Hur's arms got heavy. You know what they did? They put rocks under their elbows. They used some ingenuity. They said, we can't let his hands drop anymore. So since ours are getting tired, we'll put something under so they don't drop. That's using a little wisdom. That's not saying, well, I guess that's all you want us to do, Lord. We got tired too, so we're going on and go out fishing. No, they knew that the victory had to come. And the victory had come only as Moses' hands were held high. And Moses couldn't do it without assistance. The assistants couldn't do it without using some ingenuity. So they held his hands up, and then they put rocks under their elbows, and God gave the victory. Now, that's a type of the modern. You see, God was giving victory through Mr. Armstrong until many came along and began to pull his hands down, and some began to tie them behind him. So God withdrew the victory. Then the time came when God says, okay, I've got to give the victory. So he revived his servant, said, I want you to go out here in the victory charge, hold your hands up high, and I'm going to give you people that will hold your hands up this time. Because I'm going to get rid of those who are pulling them down, and I'm going to bless those who hold them up. So God had to begin to measure the church through the apostle to establish who will support your arms and hold them up, and who will not. Who goes with you to a place of final training because they supported you, and who goes into the tribulation. And then those who are here to hold up his hands are going to be blessed abundantly. But, th- but woe be unto anyone who tries to pull those hands down again. They can't do it, you see, because God has raised those hands toward the final victory. And no one in heaven or in earth can pull those hands down again. So God says, if anyone is out to try to pull the arms of my apostle down, I must remove him, because the victory must come this time. But those that are there to say, God, I want to support, uphold the hands of your apostle, God says, good. There's nothing I can't do for you and won't do for you for your good, to help you support my team captain, the one I placed over the team. And I'll make sure those that would want to pull those arms down and lock them behind them, I get rid of them and teach them they shouldn't have done it. So, brother, what we're called to do is hold those hands up. And you can't do it without confidence, confidence of Jesus Christ behind his apostle, and confidence in these prophecies, that some that I've read today and there are many others and having an absolute confidence that the victory is coming soon, and we're called to be on that victorious team led by Mr. Armstrong that's going to re-educate the world, and we're to prove to God we're going to hold those hands up, and we, we determine to do it, and we determine to and, and have faith and confidence that God will give us the help to make that possible as long as we keep that determination. So let's resolve to do that. See you next time.